really we've got a terrifically full agenda and I want to make sure that we can cover off what we want to and need to um, in, in terms of what is probably the most important activity for us, you know, in, uh, in, in years. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here. I wish I could see you and ask for a show of hands to see how many people were with us last year, exactly one year ago, March the 9th in Ottawa, when we had what was for me certainly the last time that I was able to truly travel um, and to be at a conference um, and uh, maybe for many of you the same thing. I know there are probably some few of you there who couldn't even get into our conference because you were already prohibited in terms of travel. So who guessed that we would be here now you know, on Zoom trying to cover off what um, I think has been certainly a, an important year of development. You, some of you will know is that uh, back in 2018, when we had our Rare Disease Day conference, we were at that time really asking, you know, can we, should we put together a, a strategy or a, a plan for access to drugs for rare diseases? What will it take for us to get there? And we talked about a roadmap. And we had used other kinds of analogies like shooting for the moon. We also, though, in 2019, I think, as you will know, it was a very exciting year for us because um, Canada had just announced that, in fact, in their budget, they were going to be allocating a billion dollars to set up over two years for Canada's first rare disease drug strategy, a huge, huge advance uh, step forward. And that has been for us continue to be a real guiding light, a real strong commitment that has driven us in terms of the planning we've been doing. As you know, in 2020, we were together in Ottawa. We actually had the chance to sit down with uh, delegates, um, with representatives from Health Canada to talk about where are we on the consultations? When can we start consultations? And we're really delighted with the meeting and also recognition that we may be able to get started soon. And of course, as all of you know, COVID hit. And we were really in lockdown in terms of everything that we were doing. Not quite sure, I'm sure uh, all of you felt the same way. Where were we going to be and how were we going to progress? We certainly thought, you know, after that conference that it would be about a month of lockdown and, you know, we'd be bouncing back out there ready to go on the road again with these consultations. And of course, that wasn't exactly the way it rolled out, but um, we uh, really began again in consultations in September, October, and we're delighted when um, Canada announced that they would be hosting consultations beginning in January with, with a very ambitious timeline to come up with recommendations by the end of March. And um, also with the opportunities, of course, to make sure that there were lots of stakeholders, including the patients and patient groups um, engaged in those consultations. Hopefully all of you have been able to take part, sign up for some of the town hall meetings that have been taking place. I know that we've gotten great feedback from people that have been in, at those meetings. Certainly I attended one patient um, meeting and also one open town hall meeting. And it was a very, very, uh, collaborative effort. It was great listening on the part of, um, I think, the hosts for the conference and lots of great dialogue from, from uh, patients and other stakeholders. We've also heard back from others, as we've said, for who have attended. And I think to a person really felt that there was a great deal of uh, respectful exchange and respectful listening, and also an opportunity to really put some ideas out. Some of you will have received, and if you have not, please do look for um, invitations to um, to extended sessions. And we're really pleased that that happened because I think as we all know, as much as we felt that there was a great opportunity to participate in these consultations, that um, those were not necessarily gonna cover off all of the issues. And we have been erasing some of those in some of our webinars and in some of the other sessions that we've been hosting. So there will be two more sessions as you uh, will know, if you haven't, uh, do look on our website, which will lead, give you an extension to them or on the Health Canada website with three um, issues to be further discussed, identified by the government, the strategy and scope, what is what should be included in a rare disease drug strategy, um, what might constitute a rare disease, is there a definition? Um, the second issue is what about funding and risk sharing models? I know this was raised in many of the town hall meetings is how are we going to actually be uh, you know, putting together the resources in order to fund these if, um, if we are looking towards having a single decision maker, a single program or plan, a single set of criteria for access, then what does 
that mean in terms of how does the funding take place? If we're looking for equity in terms of access, meaning regardless of where you live in Canada, and certainly regardless of what kind of, you know, uh, financial resources you're able to draw upon, whether it's in a private or public plan, or whether or not you are able to, to uh, a share in terms of the uh, uh, co-payments that might be necessary. If we truly want equity, how are we going to set the, up the funding models and also risk sharing models? We talked, um, I think, in many of the sessions around the opportunity to have early access, access at the time of approvals, access prior to having all the evidence. So that was one of the key points raised. And again, it begs the question of, OK, how are we going to then fund that? Um, especially if we're wanting to make sure that we can get access prior to certainly find no definitive evidence if that is, is such a thing in terms of how well the, um, the, the therapy works or what are the kinds of um, uh, returns on, on the uh, on the investments there. So I think we've been talking about that. And also, of course, for some of us really looking at the new therapies that are coming out that certainly have tremendous upfront costs, but could actually be tremendously cost effective if we look at the lifetime of the therapy. So these are important things that, you know, need to be addressed. And we're happy to see the question around funding and risk sharing models being front and center as part of the uh, consultation. And finally, as important as the issues around infrastructure and supports. We have talked in many of our other sessions, and we will talk again today around the challenges of being able to have real world evidence of being able to make early decisions of being able to provide models in which we can get access to therapies while we're still continually to collect evidence in terms of for whom and how well they might work. So I think some of these things are really important for us in terms of being able to identify you know, how uh, the system actually needs to be structured. And I think there were some of the early questions as well. Do we build it on existing systems? Will we need to build a different system? Can we do this on a drug by drug, uh, disease by disease basis? So these are important questions and obviously not going to be definitively answered at any time soon, but certainly we're thrilled to see them on the table. And again, if you have not signed up for an extended town hall, please do so. There are two sessions, one on March 15th, which is coming up soon, and one on March the 19th. And there there are, um, you know, uh, ways in which you can, as I say, on our website or in Health Canada websites, please take a look and make sure you sign up for it. Okay, so moving forward then, um, if you can just uh, put up the agenda and... Okay, our agenda for today um, is really to focus on a number of things. Um, we're just about beyond the panel. We're going to start with what we think is very important, of course, and that is to look at some of the issues around the, the um, specific issues that we need to address in terms of a rare disease drug strategy. And we're going to go to where we feel it's important to start, and that is with the, um, what are some of the uh, patient issues that are have just been recent and certainly some of the patient issues that are coming up. So we're going to have a really important patient panel to kick us off. The next, and then um, the next panel, then we'll come back to looking at what are the, um, where are we today? And how does Canada compare to the other uh, uh, countries in terms of both access and in terms of um, uh, the impact of uh, rare diseases? So we've got a, a really important uh, panel of experts for that. And then we're going to make you go to work and go into breakout sessions. And Bill's going to take us through what your tasks are going to be there in those breakout sessions and really, really important um, sessions. And then we're going to have a good, um, we don't have it written on here, but we will have at the end of it an opportunity to have some quick feedback. And then we'll have that, our closing panel um, at the end there, which will uh, really kind of bring it all home to us in terms of, okay, what do we need to do, as we've said, in order to have a rare disease drug strategy? What else do we need to have in the community in our rare disease ecosystem, in our rare disease strategy itself in order to make sure it works? So we'll stop there and then we'll talk to them at the end of the day about where we're going for, for tomorrow. Okay, so to get us started, really would like to, uh, as I said, um, invite uh, those who are on our first panel to unmute themselves. I think you know who you are, or I think Angela might be able to help unmute you if you can. And um, ask you also, if you don't mind, to turn on your videos, because we are going to get started promptly. And I think you're all here. And we're going to start, I'm just going to put up some of the, um, you know, certainly challenging issues that we've got today and that are coming up. And can you put up the slides on our current, um, some of our current issues?
sorry, I know you're also unmuting and helping people to get set up. So I'm asking you to multitask in the biggest way possible. Um, Oh, just to uh, advise to everybody, I, I'm sorry, I forgot to do some of the housekeeping. Um, we're going to ask all of you to keep your videos off and your um, microphones off unless you're on a panel, unless you're going to be taking part in the speaking. We're, we'll have an opportunity when we've got some, uh, you know, feedback later on for you to unmute yourself and certainly to unmute yourself when we're in the breakouts. We're also going to ask if you've got questions or if you've got comments, put them into the chat box um, and we will try as much as possible if we can to address some of them. We're not necessarily going to get to all of them. So hopefully we'll be able to do that. Okay, uh, great. I see uh, most of our panel is coming up here. So without further ado, I'm just going to um, a, a, a recap, you know, some of the uh, challenging issues that we've had, and we've had conference, uh, webinars on this. Um, and my first one here is around hemophilia. As you know, it is, in fact, an inherited bleeding disorders, missing a clotting factor. The treatments up to now have really been mostly clotting factor, whether they be plasma-based or whether they are bioengineered that are infused regularly into the body, have gotten better and better because they actually can be used less frequently. But in fact, uh, there are still bleeds that occur. We hear between 1 and 12 bleeds a year into the joints, into the muscles, and of course there's still a risk of infection and thrombosis. And what we do have is that we've got new factors now, new uh, treatments, um, in, in, especially a monoclonal antibody, which actually mimics the clotting factor. And the difference between it and clotting factors is that your clotting level does not go up and down depending on how recently you've actually been able to infuse. And the recommendation, um, interesting from Cadeth, is that yes, we can use it as a replacement, but only if we bring the price of that uh, monoclonal body in line with the cost of the factor product. So this is, uh, I think, where they are now in terms of trying to get access. We'll do it on a cost uh, equivalency basis. Next slide. What we've got here is, uh, a, again, a very different blood uh, disorder, acquired thrombotic uh, thrombocytopenia purpura. Um, it's a disease that is actually quite different. It's not an inherited condition. Mo it's mostly acquired uh, where the blood where blood clots will appear and it will slow, obviously, the blood to the vital organs. Obviously, could cause potentially fatal kidney failure, strokes, or heart attacks. Treatment for it is plasmapheresis, um, usually given over a period of one, two to six days in hospital, plus a regimen of steroids and maybe rituximab in order to reduce the risk in terms of clotting. The complications, obviously, are um, challenges around the actual access to the plasmapheresis and the you know, challenges of actually doing the plasmapheresis, but also there are lots of relapse, neurological deficits, cognitive abnormalities that could be a part of it. New drug comes out. Um, which is again a, some form of a monoclonal antibody. It reduces the time to the plate. In addition to the plasmapheresis, the time in which it takes in order for them to get to uh, normalization is much reduced. The chance of a relapse during the transfusion is much less. Um, it in fact received a negative recommendation um, as opposed to the hemophilia product. And basically they criticized the uh, RCT designs. And as you can imagine, this is a very challenging condition to do um, uh, rare uh, uh, clinical trials around. Next one, please. I don't want to take up too much time because I want to get to our panel. Thalassemia major is another one of these conditions that we talk about. Again, what I'd like to focus on is that it requires regular transfusions plus a chelation therapy on a daily basis in order to manage the condition. What we have for the first time is the first therapy that actually can reduce the need for transfusions, the amount of blood that needs to be transfused by about 33% in those patients for whom it's effective. And the recommendation is still pending. This is an addition to the transfusions. It does not replace them. It is, in fact, the first you know, specific therapy for thalassemia that addresses the transfusion as opposed to the actual chelation. And I think, do I have any more here? 
Oh, I, you know what? I'm not going to go into too much of this. Why don't we move through directly to the panel, if you don't mind, Angie? We'll skip this for the moment. There are emerging therapies that are coming, but I really do want to make sure that we can get to our panel. And I'm actually going to um, ask the panel, as I, you know, we introduce them and ask them to speak, that they will introduce themselves. But maybe before we do that, we've got a very quick video that we'd like to show you that maybe puts into context in a different way some of the challenges that we're currently experiencing in terms of the therapies. And again, asking you, how do we make sure we can address this if we're going to be doing a rare a, a rare disease drug strategy. So can you do the video? Here we go. Why there was such a delay in the diagnosis, and then also the, what the delay in diagnosis and access to treatment has meant for you and for, for the babies. Both of their legs are floppy, and they were not able to be weight on their leg. When we put them to stand, they are not able to stand. So we went to the fam their family doctor and we asked oh, why are they like that. And he told us that nothing to worry. Maybe kids just delayed. So from that, we were booked for the genetic test for, I think for four months in order to see the specialist. So we wait four months. So by the four months, they are turning, I think 18 months or I think. 18 months, they are 18 months. And from that, the neurologist took the blood test and we have to wait another three months. And there was an error on the center where they didn't get our baby blood. So we have to went down to seek it again after three months to get the test, okay. to get their blood test again. And then we wait for another three weeks, I believe. And then after that, I think, Finally, the test come out and they are 21 months old and we were told that they have SMA. If Stephanie and Tiffany got diagnosed and treatment while they are infant, like what we have right now, newborn screen, they would have a better chance of becoming like a normal kid and they can, who can stand and walk and even running around the house right now, not depend on us right now. I feel so sad and disappointed that we were in here here in Canada and we are fighting for almost everything to get our girl the best treatment on time to have them not getting weaker from the SMA. I feel like a loser in front of both in front of both of my girl now. Got access now. They got started on treatment for Spinraza. They've had a number of treatments for it. Have you seen that they've been able to stabilize in terms of their physical development um, since they've been on treatment? What have you noticed? Spinraza have only slowed down the progression of SMA. And I believe Sujan Smart provide a better chance for our two girls to perform like a normal to perform like a normal kid. And it is just one time treatment. What have they told you in terms of being able to get um, access to Zojan's mode? Well, we have been turned down many times with reason like they might not be qualified for funding. There is not enough evidence for kids over two years getting Sujan SMA. And Sujan SMA only work for SMA type 1 under six months old. There are at least two kids over two years have already got Sujan SMA. And there is one more kid who is going to get Sujan SMA and he is over two years in Canada. I'm feeling down and frustrated. We don't know what to do. Time is running out for both of our legs right now and we know that the longer we wait the worse for our twin right and we are hoping that there will be one neurologist who is who willing to step up and apply case by case to have our our girl to to have Sujan SMA soon before before it is too late for both of them Okay, so um, wanted to give you a bit of, you know, just the um, uh, you know, sort of firsthand indications. And we're going to turn to our panel and uh, maybe ask our panel to comment. And uh, Susie, you're not going to be surprised that I'm going to turn to you first. And, uh, you know, Susie Van Wick is the, the executive director and certainly the powerhouse behind Cure SMA Canada and has done so much in terms of advancing access to therapies. I mean, you led the fight in Canada for access to the first treatment for SMA and have been on that front lines for so many years now. And now, of course, there are two and maybe almost a third therapy as well as newborn screening. Again, something that you have fought so hard for. 
but we know that newborn screening is not available across the country and where it is available, we're still not seeing optimal treating starting as soon as possible. And I think the Chung family really illustrates where there's so many gaps in our system and hopefully helps us to understand why we need to have a you know, rare disease strategy in a, you know, an ecosystem as well as access to treatment. Um, what do you want to see in a drug strategy that's beyond just having the drugs approved? What it, you know, on your experience there? Uh, a, a little, just a small background on what SMA is. There's a degeneration of the nerve cells. So the muscles grow weaker and weaker over time. So we have um, patients who are slowly losing function physically. Mentally, they're completely normal their entire life, but physically they grow weaker and weaker over time. And until recently, we were told, I also have a daughter who's 24 years old now that has SMA. Um, at the time of diagnosis, we were told, take them home and love them for as long as you have them. Um, the most severe form of the disease, 63% of those diagnosed pass away before the age of two if they're untreated. Uh, so fast forward to today, we have a treatment that's been approved in Canada, but not equally in all provinces. Um, we have patients who are not able to access that treatment at all. We have the next one, which is a gene therapy that came in. It's approved by Health Canada and is um, applied for a case by case in a couple of the provinces, um, but that's not working really well. Not all the patients that are applying are being approved on these case by case. And then the third one is, um, is going through the approval process, but not approved yet and is being offered through EAP from the pharmaceutical company. So we have three treatments that are at some level being uh, offered in Canada, but a lot of patients are not accessing any of them. And so a no brainer for us, when we have treatments that have been proven in clinical trial that they are effective, that they're safe and that they change completely the trajectory of the disease. We have a patient who untreated would be unable to swallow or breathe eventually on their own to being treated early, to being walking around and sticking their fingers in light sockets like they, a normal kid would be doing. Uh, this is what we want to, to have understood by the government is that the earlier the treatment, the better the chances for that family. And why on earth would we not include SMA and in newborn screening when there is these safe and effective treatments available? It will change fear and anxiety into hope and planning for the future. And the sooner the better is so important. It reduces the damage caused by the disease, but also the cost to the province, the cost to the family. And that includes the stress and mental health that a family experiences from a diagnosis and lack of timely access to that life-saving treatment. Every single day matters with a disease like SME. That was so brilliantly put together. And I know you fight on each and every one of those fronts. Um, and it really has been a long time coming. But again, when you see a family, then that falls so much through the cracks. And uh, you know, I think it almost breaks your heart to realize that, you know, as much as we're scrambling, we're not really quite there yet. I mean, she does have access finally to one of the treatments, but um, again, you know, it came so very late. Um, so I'm gonna actually then pip it over to, um, if you don't mind, Jacob, to you, just have you introduce yourself as well. Um, Jacob is, uh, Jeremillo is uh, one of our advocates with cystic fibrosis and has been a huge asset in terms of not just advancing for cystic fibrosis, but for all rare diseases. And of course, CF like SMA is a serious progressive condition. Uh, and only a few years ago, of course, there were no approved therapies um, to address this underlying condition. So when the first therapy came into Canada, it certainly took a lot of advocacy on everyone's part to get it reimbursed. Um, but it is effective for only about 5% of those who, who are diagnosed with CF, the, the uh, specific uh, variant um, that it works for. But there is now a drug combination, a triple combination that's effective for, we believe, about 90% of those with CF, but it's still not available to patients in Canada. So, and like the SMA, I, there is a, a newborn screening test for um, CF. Um, what do you feel are the key elements of the Canada Rare Disease Drug Strategy Drug strategy that needs to have in place in order to serve current and future CF patients? 
I know that um, you've been working again, both on the front lines and working with us at a policy level. What do you want to see happen? What do you think has to be in included in a drug strategy? Thank you, Dohan. Um, I, I do want to just comment on Susie's point of um, one day, like just one day is too many to be waiting. And I, I usually use the thought experiment of um, somebody going out heli skiing and needing rescue. And I don't think either the public, the government, or any Canadian um, would be willing to stand waiting 10 days, waiting one month, waiting one year to deploy said rescue efforts. And that is what a rare disease community is living. So um, there's, there's so many layers of redundancy and bureaucracy and uh, duplicated processes and, and lack of common sense and lack of, in my opinion, imagination <laughs> that, that really has us in this, in this little loophole or sorry, in this little loop. Um, now, specific to, to CF, um, we, we, I guess we're lucky that we have some gene therapies available, like you mentioned, and Kaleidico was one of the first um, gene modulators that, that treats CF. Now, like you said, it only applies, or it, it's only good for 5% of the population. Uh, this, this was approved back in 2012. Now, between then and now, we still see some portions of that population, that 5%, that are still unable to access set therapy. And part of it is, is lack of data, perhaps in studies. Part of it is also the clinical variance and the manifestation of the mutations. Uh, all that to say though, is that I truly believe that the physicians should be the only ones with the authority to decide whether to prescribe the patient or not. Now, particular to Canada, I think it's really frustrating that we see are at least in, in my position to see a population around the world benefiting, benefiting from these therapies. And we see our neighbors to the south and we see our European neighbors benefiting from all these therapies while we stand here and wait. And I mean, to close, I, I think we at some point had an unspoken social contract that as rare disease population patients and families, we have been working really hard on fundraising, awareness, research, innovation, and we've gotten to this point. And now we're at the last little stretch and we're looking to our governments to say, help us, help us get to the finish line. Give us the hope that we have been praying for all these years. Um, so to see all these colleagues around the room and, and different patients, different families, truly suffering, standing on the sidelines as we deteriorate and our health deteriorates, uh, to Susie's point, I think one day waiting is just one day too long. Thank you very much, Jacob. And again, you know, to the point, right? The CF community has been a huge powerhouse in raising funds for research, contributing certainly to clinics and having good clinical care, and also putting together, which is what has been very important, is the patient registry. So in fact, having these therapies available, one can go to the registry. And now with, of course, the genetic uh, testing, genomic uh, testing, you know which patients are going to fit the, um, the therapies that are being made available. So it's not a question of, geez, is this, would this or would this not be the right patient? We still don't know exactly how well it might work for a specific patient, but you know, CF has actually invested in all of that to get us to that point. Somebody right here, and I think it's so important is that, um, you know, it's sort of like, you know, we all know that right now with, with the COVID-19 vaccine, how many of you are waiting to get access to this vaccine? The vaccine this year is tantalizingly close, you know, and it's on our shores. But guess what? Most people can't get access to it yet. I mean, luckily, the government seems to take it seriously and we will all get access at some point, but that's not a guarantee for the patients with CF. Are you going to get it before it's too late? I'm just going to do a quick video and then we're going to come back into the panel because I'd like to have you comment on this as well. Well, my name is Adam Brown. Uh, uh, as for what I do, uh, right now I do uh, a lot of things. Um, I'm really into music. I love playing the piano. Um, uh, I love playing video games. I love to draw. Um, I do Taekwondo. I'm a black belt second degree in Taekwondo. Having retinitis pigmentosa has definitely set me apart from, from all the people around me. 
And that's not necessarily a bad thing either, that I had a visual impairment and that I did need more help. So it's not like I was the outcast or anything. Um, nowadays, the, the struggles with having RP has become a lot more apparent. Um, I have trouble seeing in the dark. Uh, my peripheral vision is not great. Um, my eyes twitch all the time, which makes it harder to read. Um, so yeah, I think I would have uh, nowadays where I have to uh, travel more, especially now that I'm gonna be heading to post-secondary this year. Uh, I might have trouble uh, navigating new spaces or navigating uh, really anywhere at night that I'm that I'm not super duper familiar with. It's my YouTube channel. I've been doing that for almost two years. I have almost 4,000 subscribers. That's really what takes up most of my time. I like, I love like filming. I love, I love editing. I feel like that's one of my favorite parts most of the time is putting everything together. I have always had struggles like yeah, I can't see in the dark. Um, in school, I had to have like worksheets and stuff blown up into a bigger font so I could read it. Um, I had to use a lot of assistive technology. I do have moments where I'm like, oh man, this is, this is difficult. Like when I was going to school, like learning the bus routes, like making sure I was taking the right bus, like learning how to like learning how to travel and take public transit independently, that out that would always make me nervous. What was it like for you, and how did you learn that your children had um, a vision uh, problem, and uh, what what was the impact for you in, in terms of adapting there? Well, we're proud to be the parents of these two incredible individuals. Jenna was about three or four months old when she was officially diagnosed with. Um, RP. I was very hyper aware, hyper attuned to, you know, what the what life might be, especially in school, um, having a vision impairment. So it was just a lot of learning for us. And we spent a, much of their young, you know, their early years with, within the first year, just doing a lot of research about what means and what it is and what we can do to help support that. What was it like um, when you recognized that Adam actually may have the same uh, condition? I think um, it was similar to Jenna, but not as much despair and um, the initial sadness because they had told us we had a one in four chance of having another child that would have it. So when it happened again, I was like, wow, we we should play the lottery because- <laughs> Actually, there hasn't been a real treatment for RP for, for like forever, um, but there is now or one that has just been approved. You actually had access to a treatment uh, when you were much younger. I, I don't know if it was exactly the same treatment or with some form of gene therapy. Can you, uh, can you tell, tell us what it was like for you to actually get a, uh, a treatment at that time and what difference you feel it made in, in your life? Um, yeah, I did get a form of gene therapy when I was when I was 10 kind of like when you turn on kind of like when you turn up the brightness on your phone that's that's what I compare it to that's what it that's what it looked like for me and I was like like oh my gosh this is amazing I can see like a bit clearer like more clearer things look brighter in this eye compared to this one yeah. um yeah so it was really cool I'm going to pivot over to you, Adam, because this is the kind of heart of where we're at the moment. So, I mean, everything's about timing, right? Because, uh, um, yeah, I just don't, I just uh, don't really want the, the condition to get any worse than it is now. Yeah. So it would mean a great deal to you in being able to continue to do what you're, what you're doing now. And, and, and as you say, when you have to be independent as well. So this is something that can mean a whole lot to you in terms yeah. of the next stage in life. Um, and what, that's what we could hope. Charmaine, so I'm going to ask you, you've been told that there's like a four to six month window um, for Adam to actually benefit um, most from this treatment. Mm -hmm. And what we know is right now, we haven't gotten the approval in terms of having it reimbursed. So it's been approved. The well, I think it's the, the challenge of having to have a pause on it that because of the bureaucracy, you know, having to wait for something that I know is going to be vital for my child's day-to-day -day life or just for his everyday standard of 
living is going to be, you know, every day slowly being impaired, <laughs> um, being stifled, being stalled um, because of decision makers. This is going to radically change an individual, and in this case, my child or my children's life. Um, and, you know, he has already, because RP regresses and changes of life, and as he's going through puberty and in these last few years, there has been some regression. And so, and he has noticed the changes in how he's able to access, you know, his schoolwork, how he's been able to function daily. Um, and so we, we, want to, we want to mitigate that as much as possible. We want to interrupt that, as, that regression as much as possible. And there's a therapy that is now available. And because of our experience with Jenna, we, we have lived what this looks like. We have lit, because, she ha also had a pre, just pre, pre, uh, uh, pre, 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 pre yeah, thank you, pre, pre, it. And um, so she had it right at the exact right time. And she has had, she's been tested every, like continuously from now, now that she's 21, she had it at 11, um, no change. That it's, her vision has remained completely stable. Yeah. But now with Adam going through the same stage of life now, he, we've seen regression. So this, this, having this therapy is life changing. It could change, like change our lives for the better. It could help us become like, like not just to improve our vision, but to also like possibly improve, like help us with like our confidence in terms of doing things and doing things independently. You know, it, this is, meant to be a forever therapy. And certainly with Jenna, we've seen that it actually does stabilize. So knowing that this is already here and we're just waiting for um, the numbers to be crunched and uh, for our governments to act on behalf of its uh, citizens, whether we have to do a, a campaign or lobby um, or you know contact the press, I don't know, but um, I think it would benefit. It would be beneficial to all parents to ensure that uh, they contact whoever they need to contact to make sure that this is moved ahead. Okay, so that was a um, bit long, but very powerful. Hopefully, again, putting into context what the challenges are, and certainly, you know, we might believe that you know, a year down the road, we will have this therapy. Maybe it fully approved. It may be approved for. Some people, not for everybody. I think as Jacob has said, even with clinical, I'm shocked to learn that there's some patients who could be eligible. They're still not getting access to this therapy. I think this is, you know, and as we see it, you know, in all these diseases, right? Timing is, is so much of, uh, of what everybody's about. So I'm going to pivot over to you, Christine, if you don't mind. I mean, you're a mom. You've been advocating for your, you know, you see this mom advocating for her kids today. Um, it's been about 20 years, I think, since you had to advocate for access to the first treatment for your girls and other patients with uh, Gaucher disease. And of course, now there are several Gaucher drugs and a gene therapy that's in development and already been administered, as well as newborn screening. So it's a huge progress that's been made. But um, what do you think has been changed in terms of getting access to the right drug at the right time? And how do you feel about the process for access to gene therapy maybe when it does become available? When you see this story, what do you think has changed and what do you think needs to change in order for, you know, for us to, to be able to provide that timely access? Well, I'm, I've been just taken back 30 years. Not much has changed, unfortunately. Patients who are living the hardest times of their lives when they shouldn't be having to advocate for themselves. It's shocking that this is still going on. I went 30 years ago when my children were diagnosed. We did, um, as Jacob's parents just mentioned, about me maybe getting a media campaign going and you have to expose um, to the public your family day-to-day um, -day, um, struggles. I, I mean, that's a decision I made for my children, but I didn't want to, but it was successful in the end and we did get access. But I mean, they're going through so much stress and so much um, pressure and to have to fight to get your child a therapy. It's just shocking to me that things have not really evolved. It really does. I can't believe 30 years later, we're still doing the same thing. And what has to change? Well, I think to me, it's, so as you said, depending on where you reside, you have access to therapy or not. 
that for sure has to change. It has to be equitable for all Canadians. And I, I'm at a loss to, to say what the answer will be, but with these new gene therapies and things coming out along for our disease, whether or not we're actually gonna get, uh, get them funded is, is another matter altogether. I think um, we have uh, access to four or five different therapies at the moment, but we have an oral medication that we're fighting, we've been fighting for the last seven or eight years just to get, it's a pill. Instead of people getting hooked up to an IV and, and having to go through all that process, an invasive process, um, pills available, but we don't have access to it unless you have private insurance. And so we're still struggling 30 years later. So I'm, I'm so 100% can relate to everybody that's just told their story now. And I'm shocked that 30 years later, we're still doing the same thing. Well, thank you so much, Christine. And thank you for staying in the fight for 30 years. I mean, this is not something that um, I think you signed up for at the time. <laughs> and yet here we are. And as you say, um, I'm actually quite uh, disheartened to hear that, you know, an oral therapy is there. Um, and it's been available for a good number of years. But again, we've not been able to make it uh, available to patients on that same basis. And now with the gene therapy, you know, we've seen and Susie's talked about, you know, kind of what the challenges are every step along the way to make sure patients can get access to therapy, you know, as quickly as possible. So I, I said 20 years, I guess it really is 30 years. <laughs> so I'm going to pivot over to Celine. Celine, I would love to have you just introduce yourself um, on behalf of the Prado Willie um, community. But um, so, you know, you've got a very different story and I'd love to have you kind of share that, but also then a very different kind of challenge for the uh, uh, rare diseases and for access to therapy. So it's been more than 20 years, I think, for some of the parents of children with Prader-Willi syndrome trying to get funding for a drug that's quite frankly, both inexpensive. So we're talking about, a, you know, a, a drug strategy for high cost drugs, but we're not talk necessarily talking about high cost drugs. It's a drug that's widely available, but um, it's taken, you know, more than 20, 30 years to get access to that therapy. Can you uh, share with us a little bit about your story and kind of what you hope would happen in a, uh, in a new uh, rare uh, disease drug uh, framework or strategy? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, we're all kind of living different versions of the same reality. <laughs> It's, it's super depressing. I agree with Christine about that. Um, so my daughter uh, was born um, and diagnosed at six weeks with prader willi syndrome, which is uh, a rare and complex uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. And it has a birth incidence rate of roughly like one in 10,000 to one in 30,000. Um, and uh, so current treatments for prader willi syndrome are really limited and kind of focused in on the treatment of endocrine abnormalities um, with uh, growth hormone um, replacement therapy. So uh, growth hormone was FDA approved in June of 2000. Um, so that seems pretty straightforward up to about then. Um, but my daughter was born 15 years later. So she was born in June, 2015. Um, and uh, after diagnosis, we were informed about the importance of getting her on growth hormone therapy immediately. And I was shocked to learn that uh, in Canada, uh, parents were having to procure um, a, um, uh, uh, their growth hormone therapy off label. Um, so because it was still contraindicated here in Canada. So that kind of set me off on my path. And um, I started to volunteer my work with uh, the Foundation for Prader uh, Willie Research. And um, at the time, they were uh, mounting a provincial submission to get funding uh, here in Ontario, uh, which we received a favorable outcome in 2018 um, and a reimbursement criteria two long years later, <laughs> January 2020. And it was only just implemented uh, this, uh, this past spring in uh, 2020. So here we are. Uh, and sorry, and then in uh, June of 2020, um, uh, Health Canada finally approved um, an indication uh, for genotropin, so with a Pfizer application, um, so that it's, uh, you know, FDA approved in 2000 and then in Canada 20 years later. Um, but what does that mean for funding? Um, the, you know, as was mentioned by other people, the, the postal code is still a major um, issue. So in Ontario, uh, you know, new parents with uh, genetically confirmed uh, Prader-Willi syndrome are, are getting uh, funded access to growth hormone, but uh, mother in New Brunswick 
is likely to never get funding because they live in an Atlantic province or uh, you know, a family in Manitoba is not likely to get early intervention with it because they have crazy long wait lists for sleep studies. So I kind of view our journey to access or lack thereof of growth hormone as kind of like an indictment of our healthcare system. You know, we are, as with many rare diseases, we're, we're working against obstacles and a deliberately complex governmental procedures designed for us to languish while we wait in vain for access to equitable and competent healthcare. Um, and it's difficult, you know, prader willi syndrome is a, a, technically a rare disease, but it's relatively well known. It's easily genetically diagnosed. We know, we've known for over 20 years that growth hormone is a treatment um, and considered best practice. And yet, we're still fighting for it. And we're definitely not getting equitable access across Canada. So I'm extremely invested in the uh, National Pharmacare Plan because this is, if we can't get this right, how are we gonna get any, like I'm terrified. <laughs> What's gonna happen when these new therapies come out? We just have to wait a short 20 some odd years to just get it indicated, but not accessed, <laughs> you know? It's, uh, it's depressing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Celine. That was certainly, I think, a very powerful statement. And really, as you say, it's an indictment, not just in terms of the drug access, but of the healthcare system. And, you know, we all agree that Health Canada, uh, Health Canada, that Canada has one of the best healthcare systems in the world. I mean, we are very, all very much you know, blessed by the fact that we can get access to the kind of care that we have. But we know that as a rare disease community, we have many holes that people keep falling through. And as I said, you know, the idea of calling this a uh, drug strategy for high cost drugs, I mean, what does that mean then for, you know, drugs that are not high cost? Because there are many in that uh, respect. So you've really pointed to, I think, some of the other areas. And I think as everybody's talked about what else we need to do in the drug system, very important question that came here um, that um, I really is, is worthwhile. Um, it says from Binsley. I'm not sure if Binsley is your first name, your last name, or just a combination of a name. But um, it says a patient fighting for access to a clinical trial to get a rare, for her rare disease daughter. And so this is another challenge we've got, right? Is how do we get clinical trials here? How do we get clinical trials funded here? In many cases, patients, families, I mean, um, I think, uh, Jacob, you know very well in terms of cystic fibrosis, the kind of funding you have to do in terms of getting access to, you know, the research and the clinical trials. So what are we doing, you know, in terms of being able to attract the clinical trials here into Canada? Um, in many cases, as we know, a clinical trial, especially for a life-threatening disease, a progressive disease, is the only way you're going to get that early access. It's also a way to get clinical sites that are up and running. Um, but um, really in terms of being able to get access. I'm gonna ask any of the others, what is your experience in terms of being able to get access to clinical trials here in Canada? Um, I don't know, Susie, did you wanna to respond to that for some reason you're hot on my screen right now? It's <laughs> good to know, that's good to know. Um, yeah, and you know, we know of, um, you know, speaking with pharma, you know, that clinical trials were going to come and then they didn't and patients are then having to access clinical trials through the United States or uh, you know move to another province to and so the amount of people that actually were able to participate in clinical trials is very low in terms of the community so um, you know considering a rare disease and the low numbers we are in the first place to have a small amount of people be able to access um, you know it's devastating you know You've also had the experience in terms of trying to get access to what we might call extended clinical trials. And we have that with a lot of you know, conditions, right? Where the drug is approved based on clinical trials for a very small patient population, often children, but then we want to extend it to older children or to adults. And the clinical trials have not necessarily been done with them because of you know, a lot of reasons certainly getting drug foods. What's your experience in terms of trying to get um, our patients enrolled in extended clinical trials? So uh, one of the extended clinical trials that uh, you you um, you know helped me to remember about here <laughs> is the change of dosing for an existing treatment, and uh, you know very 
little amount, you know, very little amount of people being able to access it or none, you know, um, you know, was the pharmaceutical company willing to, you know, provide the treatment to patients so they could participate in the higher dosing, you know, it's a, it's a fight for this whole process, every step of the way. And as you have said yourself, Duran, so many times is it's a fight for inches and you start that fight all over again, next treatment that comes along and next disease and next patient. I mean, it never stops this fight for these inches. Yeah. And I think that's what we're hoping, right? With this rare disease drug strategy, let us not keep doing this. I keep calling it hand-to-hand -hand combat. You know, mm -hmm. you go out there and you, you know, kind of find one enemy and you kind of swap with them and then you go back and then another one pops up. You know, it's the worst kind of a video game that one could ever imagine that you seem to be trapped in, you know, over and over again. So, I mean, that's why we bring these stories here, right? How do we avoid doing this? And as Celine has very much said, even when the drug is not very expensive, you know, we're still not getting equitable access across the country. Where are those barriers? And how are we going to make sure that we're going to be able to plug those holes? And as we look down the road and we see more therapies coming, I'm really minded, you know, as well. You know, we've got um, a whole host of therapies that will be the first time therapies. A couple of slides I didn't really go into at the moment. One was talking about, you know, a very important disease, um, you know, um, that will be for almost the opposite in terms of some of the other conditions that we're seeing where, you know, patients actually grow an extra skeleton and, you know, they end up being trapped inside their own bodies. First disease that's coming through is going to be, hopefully be submitted soon. And we're really very, very concerned that it doesn't get hung up with delays in access to patients because again, these are time limited kinds of opportunities. Once you've passed a certain point, you don't come back, right? Most of these diseases we're talking about, once you've kind of missed that opportunity, you don't get a chance to rebuild in terms of what you've actually lost. So having timely access is probably, you know, a critical component. Um, what do we need to do then in your minds in terms of how do we get timely access? I mean, you know, you listen to the um, Kim Song and what she says, you know, Three years ago, four years ago, you wouldn't have had anything. So that's fine. All of a sudden you find that there is something here, but oh my gosh, I didn't know about it and I missed the window. You know, what do we need to have in place that would allow to have that kind of timely access for patients who are waiting? What would you recommend? Um, I know uh, some big news in our, our uh, world, in the Prada Willy world, is there's a, a new drug that's just been um, given uh, orphan drug de designation in the U.S., um, and which that alone opens up some access for, of course, the American side. Uh, but something something like that here in Canada, like like why are we not? Um, yeah, why 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 don't we have a policy around um, orphan drug designation and and so that we can speed up access? Yeah, it's an important question. You know, 1983 was when the U.S. put in their orphan drug uh, legislation. And um, many years later, you know, Canada still does not have that, though Canada will recognize somebody's orphan drug legislation for approval. But it goes back to Binsley's question in terms of clinical trials. We cannot attract clinical trials if we're not actually providing some incentives for companies to actually do the clinical trials here and to actually engage with us in terms of having ongoing sites, you know, in terms of access. And, and I think that's the question, you know, do we in Canada, is it okay that we kind of wait until clinical trials have been done elsewhere and we're going to wait for the drugs to come to us, right? Um, you heard the uh, conversations between Jenna and, um, and Adam. I mean, Jenna actually was sent to the States to get access to a clinical trial for the same therapy, pretty much the same therapy her brother's trying to get access to right now. And that was 10, 11 years ago. There were no clinical trials here. Um, I think her physician probably, you know, very much involved in this was able to find out and make that happen. But is that is that what we want to count on? Is that we'll wait until 10 years later? Jacob, you want to add something to that? Yeah. Yeah, Durhan, I, you know, I want to take a step back here because we can't have it both ways. We can't close the door on pharma and, you know, treat them like the enemy and alienate them and then expect them to save us. And I say that as Canadians, from the government, from policymakers, from politicians. And part of me feels that we need some political political leadership, a champion to, to really carry this forward, 
while still stripping the politics out of it. And, and I think it's, it's really frustrating um, that not only the public, but also our elected officials are really not aware of all the nuances that we speak about in these rooms. Um, because I, I'm sure advocates around this, this room could agree that when we reach out to our elected officials, they're really not aware of what is happening. I, I, I'm not sure if there's no capacity. I'm sure you know, global pandemic doesn't help every health department and every province or federally, but, uh, but this issue has permeated our community before that. So I don't think that's an excuse. Um, so to some degree, like, and, and I mean, this starts with PMPRB, clinical trials have obviously been affected because of that as well. So to some degree, I, I just don't, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm just frustrated. And, and to Celine's point, it is very depressing how, how we're stuck in this, in this loop. And uh, I, I mentioned imagination in my opening remarks because I, I truly feel that uh, we need some imagination not to come up with a solution. Like I said in the chat, other countries have figured this out. So it's not a problem that has not yet been solved by anybody around the world. There are solutions, there are models that work. There's risk sharing arrangements. Uh, so all our issues have been to some degree um, solved, quote unquote, in other jurisdictions, other countries. Um, I just hope that uh, Canada in these consultations that, that are ongoing right now uh, are able to, to break away from the mold. It, it seems like they're just reworking tweaking here and there, you know, the, the overwhelming conversation of a natural pharmacare, uh, in my eyes, or at least how I've understood it so far, leaves the registered community as an afterthought. Yep. Um, and, and, and they try to implement natural pharmacare ahead of a Red Sea strategy. And I know even that term has now just been completely politicized and uh, we're now escaping it, but, yeah. Um, yeah, you know. Yeah. So let me just kind of try to wrap it up because we're just running out of time. And I know that you, you know, you have, um, I think, led this discussion in so many different venues. So we appreciate it. And we'll continue to look for that. And you've brought up so many important points that we had not gotten into yet, but, you know, maybe we need to. And that is, what do we do about the relationship between, you know, the researchers and the pharmaceutical industry in Canada? And what are we doing to incentivize research and development? What are we doing to incentivize clinical trials here in Canada? I mean, we are a small country relative to the EU, which is all these 25, 26 countries. We're a small country relative to the US. And unless we're really willing to be aggressive about it, we will find ourselves 30th in line in terms of access. And is that good enough? Is that really kind of where Canada would like to sit? And we don't want to overplay what's happening in terms of the COVID vaccine, but I think we all see it, right? And I think, you know, I heard this morning on the news that, you know, the US has now vaccinated, what, 10, 12? 15% of their population, and we've vaccinated one and a half percent. Like, where are we and why are we not being that aggressive? The UK, which is slightly bigger than us, than what they vaccinated, like what, 33 some percent of their population. But that's because they deliberately said, we need to do this. And I think as many of you will know, we won't talk about it now, the UK has just reinitiated and refunded their rare disease strategy, not just a drug strategy. They say, we're making a commitment. And I think that's what we're asking for here. But hey, you know what, you guys? We have a billion dollars on the table. So I'm putting this up as a challenge. What the heck can we do with a billion dollars? Let us take this and really think about, we've got a commitment. And it's not just gonna be in terms of bringing in drugs. We could buy a lot of drugs for a billion dollars for the greater Willie. <laughs> we could fund everybody many times over. You guys could just stock up your fridge with this stuff forever. But you know, we need to think about what's that wise investment, right? And I think that's what we're all here collectively about. A huge thanks to Susie, to Jacob, to Christine and Celine for amazing contributions here. And uh, hopefully, you know, as we move forward, we'll all be able to kind of look at what the next step is. And that next year, this time, we're not talking about can we have a rare disease drug strategy, but how we're going to implement this. What is the shape to it? And we're looking forward to that. And hopefully all of you will be here for that follow up. So thanks very much to this panel. Huge, huge thank you. Thank you, Jarhan. Thank you. And with that, we're going to pivot to our next panel, quite frankly. Great discussion. So let me ask... Um, our next panelists to kind of turn on their screens if they don't mind. And uh, we will try to get into this immediately because we this is a short panel for all extents and purposes, but it's a very important panel as well. I think I need to have... Uh,
Norm, Jason, and Lindy, who have been with us many, many occasions, right? So are we ready here? Hide your hand. Hey, hey, all right. Good job. Good job, you guys. Hey, Lindy. Hello. Okay. Um, Jason, Norm? Yep. I'm okay. I'm well, we're ready to go. So what yep. I'm going to do is just very quickly, because I want to turn it over to you guys as the real experts. I'm going to very quickly just do a number of background slides. And these are actually your slides. So <laughs> I've just kind of stolen from you to show you again, but to set the context for what we want to talk about, you know, really our question in this panel and what we're hoping you will, you know, help lead us through is, you know, where is Canada with regard to the rest of the world? And, you know, we've raised some of the questions around the fundamental premises, you know, in terms of Canada. Is Canada performing at par? Is Canada really kind of uh, at a big risk in terms of having rare disease drugs overtake not only our drug budget, but our healthcare budgets, if the rate they're going. Is this really where we are? And what do we need to do then in terms of the innovative uh, rare uh, R&D? So just gonna ask um, Angie, if you don't mind to uh, and take us there. Okay, these are slides that I've unashamedly uh, uh, taken from both Lindy and Norm. So this is, uh, and just to give set the stage, and I'm sure she could speak to it a lot better than I do. Actually, you know, why don't I stop for a second? Lindy, I'll let you speak to these two slides because they're yours. Just tell us what they say in here. Actually, sorry, Durhan, they're not mine. I think they're Norm's. Oh, these are Norm's slides? Yes. Yeah, this. Oh, sorry, flip that. Okay, okay, Norm, you speak to them. <laughs> yeah, sure, I can, I, I can speak specifically to this first slide and then maybe we can go into it in a bit more detail later on. But yep. uh, Takeda commissioned, uh, the Office of uh, Health Economics last year to conduct a comparative analysis of access to drugs for rare diseases across 16 different markets, including Canada. And what this particular slide is showing, one of the metrics was rate of reimbursement, which is the percent of uh, market authorized products that actually end up being reimbursed. And I think if I recall correctly, uh, they looked at 215 uh, drugs for rare diseases across a 20 year period. And uh, what this slide is showing is that uh, Ontario, used as a proxy for Canada, is below the median um, and, and quite a bit uh, below the leading European markets, which have rates of reimbursement of above 60%, above 65%, and Germany, which has a rate of reimbursement uh, above 90%. Okay, so we're so nowhere close to. I always love. I love this slide because I always use Slovenia as my proxy for how how we're doing. So I love to see that we're right next to Slovenia. They're exactly as I in my back of the envelope calculations end up with. Next slide, there. I think it's still yours, Norm. Yeah, this slide. Then uh, the other metric they used to measure um, access to drugs for rare diseases was time to reimbursement, which they measured as the time from market authorization to first listings. And here again, um, Canada is below the median uh, of the countries that were measured around 800 days over the, the 20 years on average um, to reimburse some product. And, and because we used Ontario as a proxy, the, the actual numbers for, for Canada spread across all of the provinces would probably be worse than this, but we used the, the leader in, in Canada in terms of, of access. Uh, but even then, well below uh, the 10 markets that are performing at a higher rate. And if you averaged out those 10 markets, I think on average, their time to reimbursement is just over one year with Germany, right, just uh, taking under a month. Great. Thank you. So again, providing that context, right, we're trying to implement a new rare disease drug strategy. And the backdrop we've got right now is that we're far below you know, certainly the international average where we would like to be both in terms of the drugs coming in, the drugs that are being reimbursed and also the time to reimbursement. The next one, I think the next one is yours, Lindy. There you go. <laughs> yes. And uh, this slide was actually shamelessly stolen from the PMPRB. And what this slide is showing uh, is the PMPRB re uh, PMPRB's report suggesting that the drugs for rare diseases, which they call expensive drugs for rare diseases are the fastest growing segment of the pharmaceutical market. And what I'd like to highlight here is in the yellow portion of each of the bars, uh, that is the actual expenditure annually uh, of the total drug expenditure represented by the drugs for rare diseases. Whereas the blue portion of the bar is the oncology medications. And it's not 
necessarily all oncology medications, but it's the ones that were originally designated as rare uh, oncology indications. But what we are arguing is that over time, as other drugs come to the, or sorry, other indications come to the market, those particular oncology drugs have, have an expansion of their market size and they overwhelmingly represent a large portion of this, as you can see, the DRD expenditure. So it's not really uh, an apples to apples comparison. I think there's some uh, dirtying of the, of the analysis here. Uh, but the overall takeaway message is there is a, a thinking on the part of the PMPRB that these cost of rare disease drugs are runaways. Uh, there's many other analyses that they could do. They could look at the average cost of DRDs. Um, we know that the incremental cost effectiveness ratios will always be high, but there has to be some way of looking at the data uh, the cost per patient relative to the, the market potential. And we know that the, the market sizes are all very small and don't warrant this additional um, uh, focus by the PMPRB, in my opinion. Great, next slide there. It's still yours, Lindy, no problem. Okay, and uh, what our organization at Patient Access Solutions did was to provide some perspective, even before this PMPRB report came out, we had looked at the total cost of drugs for rare diseases in Canada over time. We looked at drugs that are in the pipeline, uh, plus drugs that are in market now, and we projected out a over a five-year time horizon, what would be the total cost of those medications? Uh, for the reasons I described uh, earlier, we excluded the oncology medications just because they, they have different uses and their, their utilization certainly uh, exponentially grows over time. And what we found uh, was that, at, in, in fact, we had a figure almost identical to the PMPRB figure, which is about 2% of the total pharmaceutical spend is on drugs for rare diseases. So I, again, I think this just highlights the fact that the, the scrutiny over the cost of drugs for rare diseases and the growth in the market uh, is unwarranted and in fact is ignoring the benefits that these medications are bringing to patients, how they're life-changing, life-extending, et cetera. Yeah, and I think the next couple of slides also reinforce that. When, next slide there, and yeah, this is kind yeah, of- Yeah, so this, this is just a, a pictorial on how the uh, drugs for rare disease market is expected to expand over the years. So at the time we did the analysis uh, and, and very recently we're starting with a 2% and we're growing out over a five-year time horizon uh, just to 6%, which is really a, a small portion of the market. Okay, so thanks. I just wanted to do that. I don't know. Is that the end of it, Angie? No. Is that the last slide? Yeah, that is the last slide. So I'm going to bring you guys back into the discussion live and maybe you know, in order to bring Jason Field in from Life Sciences Ontario, I'm going to kind of pivot to you for a second and ask you to kind of give us a commentary here. Uh, where, where do you see Canada standing in terms of our investment in rare disease drugs? Are we on a runaway trajectory here? Do we um, need to consider what else we want to do in order to assure that we've got the industry, you know, bringing in these therapies? And what would be the added benefit beyond just the patient access in terms of having an active industry that's bringing in or investing in innovative therapies in, in the can. It's a big question, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll pivot it over to you, Jason. All right. Thank, thanks, Duran. Um, and I think, you know, the, to answer the first part of that question, no, I don't think um, uh, rare disease medicines are you know, uh, something that's a runaway uh, train in terms of our health expenditures. I think, um, you know, the data that, that Lindy and, and uh, Norm have uh, shown, you know, uh, is consistent with everything that, that we've seen uh, in terms of data. And, you know, just to put it into to perspective, overall drug expenditure in Canada is, is somewhere around six or 7% of total healthcare expenditure. And so now you're talking about 2% of that six or 7% when you're looking at rare disease. So you can see what a small portion in terms of overall health expenditure we're talking about here. Um, it, it really is um, um, not a huge, um, huge amount. What becomes of a concern, I think, for policymakers is, is the price tag that's associated with individual products. 
And that's why we hear terms like expensive drugs or in the current consultations, high cost drugs. And I think, you know, the conversation has to shift from high cost to high value uh, because a lot of these products, as was discussed in the previous panel, they're revolutionary treatments for these uh, disease states and the value that they bring in terms of not just the patient outcomes, but, you know, economic uh, productivity, um, you know, uh, other areas of the health system or, um, or, or social uh, programs within government. But there's no mechanism currently within government to realize uh, these additional values. And I think that's where there's a fundamental problem uh, with this concept of uh, assessing high value, high impact uh, medicines, particularly when we're talking about rare diseases and these small communities. But I also really liked what Jacob said about sort of putting the cart before the horse, right? Talking about national pharmacare without solving this problem first really is uh, doing things backwards because treatments in, you know, for all disease states are gonna become more personalized which means smaller market sizes, more rare disease-like in terms of, um, of the structure of these medicines and therapies. So we need to solve this problem fundamentally, not just for rare disease patients, but for the future of, of, of healthcare in Canada and how we continue to deliver healthcare. So it's, it's a fundamental change in terms of how we deliver healthcare, how we pay for medicines, and that's why it's so important that this needs to be addressed now. And, and the reason why that this rare disease uh, strategy and the discussions we're having here today are so important for the entire healthcare system in Canada. Yeah. I mean, I love the notion that you're saying uh, is that we're talking about, you know, this is an investment. You know, it, we, you know, we kind of look at, as you see, just at the end of it, how much does it quote, cost in order for us to actually cover these drugs for people who need them, but what if we were to flip it around right, in terms of thinking about it as an investment? So let me ask you, Norm, I mean, you are in the industry there. What is it that um, providing a rare disease drug, what investments do you also bring into this? Well, may maybe Dirhan, if, if I can, I wanna just come back a little bit to the first question because we, um, we shared Canada's ranking vis-a-vis -vis other countries in, in pure numbers, right? We're, we're below the median in terms of both rate of reimbursement. We're below the median in terms of time to reimbursement. But um, based on the, um, the experiences that were shared by the families in the very first panel, I also want to put it in human terms. So in human terms, what that means is uh, that Canadians with rare diseases are waiting longer to access fewer drugs for rare diseases than their European counterparts. And recognizing that is very important as we embark upon this process of defining a rare disease strategy or rare disease framework for Canada. Um, because there were positives in the study that we did and in the analysis that we did. For one, when we took a look at the European markets um, that were studied, the 16 European markets, over the past 10 years and over the past five years versus the past 20 years, they all showed market improvements, not just incremental improvements, but significant improvements in access to drugs for rare diseases, including the Eastern European markets. And the one thing that all of those countries shared in common was the adoption and the implementation of a rare disease strategy. And the other positive uh, in the analysis we did is that there are consistent high performers, countries like Germany, France, Italy, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and the UK, uh, which were always at the high end of both of those metrics, rate of reimbursement and time to reimbursement. And so I think there's a real opportunity to look at their best practices, their principles, their policies, their processes that have made them leaders in access to drugs for rare diseases and take this opportunity to see which of those best practices could be adopted uh, to the Canadian landscape and to the Canadian market as we embark upon uh, building the rare disease strategy for Canada. You know, that's such an important kind of perspective, right? And again, where what is the role in terms of, um, you know, the, um, you know, certainly in terms of those kinds of partnerships. And again, you know, I, I go to our colleagues over in the UK who, as we all know, have just left the EU and now they're no longer going to be part of that huge regulatory and buying block. And we do see what the UK is doing. Is there 
bending over backwards to lure the industry and to provide incentives, to ask the industry to come in, set up your clinical research, your set up your research laboratories here, help us in terms of being able to provide opportunities for investment in you know, innovative research here. And I think they're recognizing as we need to, that if you're going to be working in that perspective, you have to be able to provide those kinds of incentives. So, you know, I think Bill has been right, wrote a very long uh, comment in here, um, which does come back to that same point, right? What if we thought about rare diseases as not a cost center, but as an investment? What are the other opportunities? And I sometimes do say to you know, the industry as well, what are you gonna give me? What else can you give us here in terms of helping build you know, clinical expertise? What are you gonna build in terms of support programs? What are you gonna contribute in terms of being able to further you know, the understanding of these diseases beyond just what is that treatment? Lindy, what do you see? I mean, you have a projection here that goes up to 6%. I'd be kind of interested in what you build that 6% on. Uh, that was based on uh, looking at EMA lists and FDA lists and, and trying to assess which products would or should come to market in Canada, uh, which were the most likely in the time frame of the analysis. Uh, looking at typical, um, I guess, times, times to come to Health Canada, uh, times to go through the HTA uh, process and then negotiate with PCPA. And so that's what the analysis was based on. Uh, certainly if, if we were to be involved in Orbis, uh, you know, the ex expedited Health Canada regulatory review, uh, and maybe have some streamlining in terms of the uh, PCPA negotiations. Uh, our experience is that those negotiations take a very long time. Uh, if we could set out some ground rules, that would be helpful. Uh, when we're at the PCPA table, the, the level of discounts that are requested are, are enormous and often uh, much more significant than, than what companies are seeing in European countries, which are much larger. So all of that takes a lot of time. Uh, I think, and time is of the essence when it comes to reimbursement of these medications because they truly are uh, life-saving and, and life-extending, life-changing for patients. Uh, so it, it's possible that that curve could be higher if we had a shorter time to reimbursement, but I don't think it would be exponentially higher. It would just, you know, we would move, move a year or two earlier uh, so that we might reach the 6% growth in three years rather than five years. Yeah, not, I mean, those are, you know, numbers that we have always kind of liked to play with. I mean, once upon a time, we talked about the 2% solution for rare disease drugs, and that is going to be about 2% of the budget, you know, if we funded everything. And we look at countries like France or Germany, where they actually do fund a whole lot more, and they're still only about 6% in terms of the total drug spend. So I think it is, you know, a realistic that if we were to look at the medicines coming in, we were to do better. Um, it, some of the comments coming here also really suggest that we need to take a sort of a whole of the medicines approach, right? And Jerry talks about, you know, if we look at what we've already expended, in, what we're spending now in terms of rare disease drugs, and even with drugs coming in, so many of them that are on a per patient basis seem to be very high, we're not actually expanding the percentage of what we're paying for drugs in terms of the total health care uh, spend. So I think, again, you know, given that these drugs, in fact, do provide better value, we're actually being able to get more value based on certainly the same kind of spending. So, you know, again, it's kind of, I think what everybody's saying is that we need to take a bigger look than just what is the cost per drug that's coming in there and what do we need to do in order to make sure that we've got good investment there. Jason, I know you folks are doing a lot on the innovative and development front and how does this fit in with some of the other initiatives that you folks are envisioning, not just for in Ontario, but across Canada in terms of uh, research and in, into, into innovation? How does this fit in in terms of having better access to, to these therapies? Thank, thanks, Graham. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we have envisioned here at LSO and, and a lot of uh, different organizations now are picking up on this, um, I think in the wake of COVID-19, and we even hear federal governments and provincial uh, governments launching, you know, biomanufacturing strategies. We've been talking about um, a coordinated life sciences strategy for the last decade or more. Um, and the, the reason why we say a coordinated strategy is what this industry, what this sector really needs is an all of government approach, one that is coordinated. It's a very unique industry in that sense. 
So we have innovation policy, we have economic policy, we have health policy. And if those policies are misaligned, it creates barriers. It creates barriers for manufacturing. It creates barriers for uh, regulatory approval. It creates barriers, barriers to access of medicines for patients. Uh, it creates barriers for clinical trials. So the way to get rid of those barriers is to align policies. And one of the challenges, I would say the biggest challenge we've had um, you know, in all the time that I've spent working in this industry is the sort of siloed approach uh, within government uh, when it comes to um, you know, innovation policy, economic policy, and health policy in particular. Um, I would say in particular health policy, um, they operate some, somewhat siloed compared to other areas. And I think even within the health ministry, when we look at how drugs are paid for, right? It's a fixed budget with a certain allocation that you're gonna to expect to increase over, over time. And if products come along that disrupt that model, uh, which they have, and they will continue to, to come, uh, it throws things into chaos and it throws those budgets out of whack because there's no mechanism within government to realize the value across these siloed budgets. So it, it takes a different approach about thinking about not only how we deliver and value uh, medicines and, and healthcare, but it's also how do we align that health policy and that broader initiative to ensure that we have capacity within life sciences in the case of pandemic situations that we have now, that we have um, a robust clinical research environment so that patients can get early access to these medicines and these clinical studies. So that, that's, that's the work that we're doing in that space. That is so important to, to bring it all in, right? And I think that's what, you know, Norm and Lindy and others have been saying, you know, it's the opportunity as we're looking at this rare disease drug strategy, not just to narrowly focus on how do we need to change the rules so that we can actually, you know, pay for some of these drugs or have a, even just a uniform, you know, uh, 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 you know formulary, it, it goes way beyond that. And this is an opportunity. We've kind of taken this to, and I say, what do we, how do we position, right? Rare disease drugs within that broader landscape. And I think that's what you're saying. A couple of really important comments coming through Michael Ryder. And I'll just read it. And I would love to have you folks just respond to it. He writes, um, you know, as an observation, there's been a shift in the top drugs paid for by um, public plans. 15 years ago it would have been cardiovascular drugs. Now there are anti, you know, DNF drugs and drugs from uh, macular degeneration, a shift from drugs used by a lot of people to drugs used by fewer people. And some of these may not just be rare disease drugs, but definitely much more focused populations. How do you how do you respond to that? Do you feel that that is actually accurate? And how do we factor that in then when we're talking about, you know, that landscape that goes beyond obviously just rare disease drugs? I mean, we are talking about funding for rare, I mean, access to rare disease drugs, but it sits within a whole landscape. Any thoughts? I'll, I'll jump in, Durhan, because I've got an analogy that might make sense here. Um, I, I think what's what's driving this shift is actually the new technology, the new platforms, more personalized, more targeted uh, therapies, and that's going to continue on. That's that's the advancement of medicine. More personalized means smaller market size and more targeted. The example I always like to give is CAR T. Right? CAR T is revolutionary cancer treatment where they're going to look at your your own cells, take your own cells, create a therapy based on your cancer. Uh, to deliver a very personalized um, uh, treatment. Now put it into a context that we all understand. When you go to the Toyota dealer and buy a Camry off the lot, right? You're buying the same Camry as all the other guys or, 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 or women, um, uh, you know, if you're buying a base model Camry. So, um, but if Toyota comes to your house and watches you drive and measures up your body and then builds a custom Camry just for you, that's not gonna cost the same amount as one you buy off the lot. It's, it's very, very different. And that's what we're talking about here. So there is a shift in, in these medicines and it, but it's being driven by technology and that's what's driving this. That's brilliant. And certainly I think, as you say, of course, if I'm going to do that, I probably just go for the rolls. And then why do I want to customize Camry? But uh, I think you're absolutely right. And I think, you know, in some respects, we've been talking about the rare disease drug strategy as a bit of a forerunner for what PharmaCare might look like, you know, writ large. Um, and not PharmaCare just in terms of a public, you know, drug plan. But, you know, 
because we're seeing these drugs are coming together, right? The drugs for rare diseases are increasingly the model for drugs for cancers, drugs for other kinds of personalized therapies and rheumatoid arthritis and cardiovascular disease. All of these are gonna be increasingly small patient populations, which you know have some of the same challenges as we see in rare disease drugs. So to the degree that you know we're gonna be able to get this right, we're gonna be paving the way for some of these other targeted therapies to be able to be able to come into the market, to be able to be well supported and also be able to demonstrate the value back. Because um, it, it may, and in some respect, you know, it's a little bit of the, the backwards of it. So we are gonna have smaller, um, you know, Michael responded back exactly. You know, we're gonna be having smaller targeted patient communities. We're gonna have drugs that are more precisely designed for those communities. It's like my Camry, right? I mean, at least, you know, I know that it's going to absolutely fit me. You know, if we had a Camry and I can tell you trying to get my legs to work in a Camry that also worked for my six foot husband was absolutely a nightmare. This was not coming together really easily. So I get it, right? Um, you know, we need to be able to have, I think, the, that personalization because that is where we're all positioning, but we need to have a drug system that's going to get us there. Norm, what do you think? You know, where is... Um, Where's the industry position then? You know, is this something that we're looking forward to in terms of other disease areas as well? I think there's the same spirit, right? Applied to both, which is ensuring Canadians aren't being left behind and um, there's fair and equitable access to available treatments. The science um, um, grow, grows and expands and as the science and technologies Im improve, um, people should be able to benefit from those as well. And it's not just a trend. I think the important thing is we shouldn't be looking at this as just a trend that's happening in Canada. This is happening around the world. Uh, and as we've demonstrated, other countries have figured it out. And uh, one of the big drivers uh, for, for some of the major markets that uh, have a much higher performance than Canada when it comes to access for drugs for rare diseases is early access mechanisms. Early access mechanisms exist in Germany, France, Italy, the Netherlands, um, and so I think we should be looking at some of their models and seeing how we can apply them in Canada. So I'm just ready to wrap this up. I really feel that, you know, this has been an amazingly, you know, um, comprehensive discussion and can't tell you how much we appreciate it because it is important that we look at the overall landscape. And it's also important that we get right where we are. Um, I know this is one final comment from Michael, which I think is very good. Well, it isn't his final comment, it was an important one. You know, the impact though in, let's say a children's hospital with these drugs coming in, they're in hospital drugs, what do we do there? Because they are wrecking havoc with the uh, hospital budgets, for instance. I mean, the answer is actually quite simple. Just get your budgets right. We can anticipate what drugs are coming in. We can anticipate what the impact might be, but part of this whole rare drug disease drug strategy, right, is trying to also think about the financing model. So I'm really pleased that you know Health Canada has put that into that next consultation. You know, it doesn't mean that we have to pay for every drug in, in it's entirely upfront. We go back to the risk sharing, right, and you know, and it would be a tragedy to limit the access for patients to life-saving or life-enhancing therapies because we couldn't figure out the finance model. I mean, honestly, we can do that, you know? Um, and we've talked about other kinds of, you know, you know, epidemics and other kinds of catastrophes where the right investment is what we need and we don't really, you know, want to put people at risk. So huge thanks to Norm, to Lindy, and to Jason for this very, very, I think, uh, comprehensive and, and really, you know, informed discussion and um, it will serve as well, I think, as we go into our next uh, panel. Uh, our next panel is actually breakout groups and um, we didn't really build any breaks in here. So, you know, in that little transition into your breakout groups, hopefully that is uh, a little time if you need to. So I'm gonna turn this now over to um, uh, Bill Dempster, who is really uh, my second in, um, in, in command here at all times and uh, ask you to take us into the breakout sessions. Thanks, Durhan. And uh, I thought that the, the, the previous panels were excellent lead-ins to this one because now we're going to put everyone to work. And in fact, you know, as you can see in the chat group, and uh, I'm sure that you know your your messages to everyone are just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I've noticed a lot of people are, are sending direct messages and using that really effectively. Now we're going to rely on you to break into separate groups. Um, uh, you are each going to. Each group is going to appoint a lead to help uh, direct traffic and, and moderate some of the discussion and uh, a scribe. So um, 
I'm just going to quickly share my desktop just because uh, it was um, uh, on the agenda that was that was shared with everyone, but just to remind people what they'll be expected to do. The breakout groups are going to be uh, created automatically. So again, apply, pick a lead, pick a scribe, take as many notes as possible. You're only going to have 15 minutes to do this because we want to spend 10 to 15 minutes when you come back. So there will be a bit of a, a countdown clock. Um, we're building towards what CORD can um, submit to Health Canada as part of this consultation and uh, and build towards and, and add to uh, Canada's rare disease strategy more broadly. Um, to do that, uh, Durahan has designed this, uh, this workshop and this breakout group um, around the North Star for Canada's rare disease and drug ecosystem. So, First of all, uh, aligning with our North Star, public health centered. What is a, a, you know, a public health approach to making sure that uh, Canadians get access to the medicines that they need? Um, evidence centered. What, what uh, kind of data do you need to, in order to uh, show um, how and where the medicine is working or not working? Uh, and, or even getting access to the medicine? What, what uh, level of tests? Might you need to actually show that this 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 patient would be um, uh, would benefit from this medicine, and perhaps most importantly, patient-centered. Um, as I said in my long uh, chat group post, uh, you know, the, uh, rare disorders are extremely heterogeneous. They're very different, and it takes um, uh, a very patient-centered and disease-centered approach to really uh, address uh, each of them. Now, with that in mind, and, and that north star there. Um, let's incorporate our values and principles. So patients engaged as partners, R&D and public-private partnership, ensuring there's a competitive pharmaceutical sector that's ready to be here and develop and commercialize medicines, the networks of clinical expertise so that somebody from Northern Ontario can go to Winnipeg uh, or get to the person in, in McGill, and we're going to hear from somebody later who's an expert in neurodegenerative uh, uh, disorders and neurology um, as well, and a lot of people around the country actually rely on that kind of center. Safe, effective, timely, personalized, affordable medicines for individuals and health systems. So dealing with that, um, uh, th that issue for both individuals and health systems. Equity in access and healthcare and outcomes. So a single framework to sort of monitor equity and um, uh, to, to review how each of the provinces are doing or each of the health systems or even regions for that matter or clinics. Consolidation across geographic and funding cycle, silos, and, and Jason mentioned that earlier from Life Sciences Ontario. It's you know getting the the, the, the different um, uh, parts of government to actually work together, um, uh, you know, and in fact not just the parts of government, but the different governments, and that's provincial and and federal, uh, ensuring that the plan is economically viable and that there's a transparency and accountable, a transparent and accountable uh, process for, for this actually um, uh, being put in place. What you're gonna do now is go into your, into your separate groups and, um, uh, and what we wanna hear is the top one or two points that come out. So please take lots of notes um, as you discuss what you've heard earlier. What are, you know, um, how do we make sure that our values and principles are actually um, implemented in achieving and getting towards our North Star. So what you're going to report out is what are the one or two things that you would do uh, right away if you could snap your fingers and, and, and make something happen, uh, what would you like to see that, that be in order for us to get closer to our North Star? So with that, Angela, I'm going to ask for, for you to actually split everyone out. We'll see you back. You'll see the, tie, the, the countdown clock. Take lots of notes. We're going to look for your top one or two. But please send us the notes that you take because they are all uh, going to be very helpful as we build um, a submission to Health Canada and, in fact, that we're going to use across the country as, um, as all governments are looking to, uh, to do something for RARE, which is great. Okay. Um, Ange, I don't know if I have to do anything else. Oh, great. I get to join room 10. Everyone, go join the room that uh, Angela is telling us to join. Thank you.
Hey, Bill, it's Jerry. Uh, how are we uh, reporting back uh, from the sessions? Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes, so we're going to actually start the one o'clock a bit later. Um, so we'll thank uh, our four panelists. We're going to start that one at actually 1.15. We're, I'm going to ask each of the leaders to bring back their words from the breakout sessions. Is that what you wanted uh, us to do now, Bill? <laughs> yeah, we're going to give it another. I, I just want to see the view. It looks like everyone's forced back in. So we are ready to go. And just a quick note, as some of you might have heard, thank you to our 1 p.m. Eastern panelists. Um, we're going to actually start that panel about in about 15 minutes because we want to give the opportunity for each of the breakout rooms to to read back the one or two key takeaways from that and I can't emphasize how important this um, this brain dump and input is for uh, for, for cord uh, that's that's right now working on its submission to Health Canada among other you know key documents and interventions and engagements with governments and health systems across the country so um, where where is group one who is a leader or the the um, Bill, I was a scribe. Okay, Rob, good to see you. Good to see you, Bill. So I'll get going, um, move, moving things along quickly. Um, we basically had three. So if you'll allow me the, uh, the privilege to take three, Bill, instead of two. Um, but certainly the first one, which was front and center, was to move as fast and as quickly as we can to a German model speed up access and numbers of drugs that are available to, uh, to rare disease patients. Secondly, a greater alignment between HTA bodies and the regulator, uh, integrating on how data is analyzed is one of the specifics. And then really the third one is uh, increasing the ecosystem in Canada and really reinvesting in research and development so that we are um, uh, moving forward with new therapies and new treatments available in Canada, uh, clinical trials and all the associated spin-off effects of clinical trials. So those were the top three, Bill. Amazing, thanks, Rob. Um, and if, if, if Rob or previous speakers have already said one of the priorities, we're just gonna put a pin on that and just say, you know, German model or HTA, et cetera. So let's go to group two. Um, who was the lead or scribe from group two? Bill, I don't know what number I was in. So. Well, Sylvia, why don't we go with Sylvia's group then? So if I say group three and you're in, why don't oh. we start with, we go go for it. Okay, so Sylvia's group. Okay, so excellent. Uh, so somehow I self-selected as the leader and um, scribe. So. Uh, we actually didn't focus strictly on the, the top items. We kind of uh, went through a number of items, but I'm going to just put them in, in order and do the first three that we discussed. So the first one was the, the uh, criticalness of clinical experts. So having clinical experts that actually have expertise in the area and have treated patients with the disorder. Um, and perhaps the idea of having more than one person uh, as the clinical experts, because I know at the provincial level, sometimes it is one person, and then there might be a possibility of transparency about who the team is, so that you actually know who's making the decisions. Uh, so the, the clinical expertise being really relevant to the disease being looked at was our first point. Um, the second one was around equity across the provinces, and this was felt to be probably the biggest challenge that we have here in Canada, and um, whether we should perhaps look at other models in the world, like the UK model, would that work for Canada, and um, moving to basically the idea of having greater alignment across the provinces, um, so that um, uh, access is, is more coast to coast. Um, and and mm -hmm. the third one oh, is about patient engagement. So ongoing patient engagement is important um, and the lived experience is essential to understanding the, 
impact that these um, disorders have on people. And so there should be a built-in mechanism to include patients. Um, we did bring up the whole CADIS submission um, idea, like that or something different, but basically something baked in. Um, and I think I'm, I, we did briefly discuss the unique nature of the R&D and whether we're in Canada because of our small market and uh, whether we could connect more internationally. Um, those are probably our, our, um, all our points. So, okay, yeah. Thank, thanks, Sylvia. And we're, we're, we talked about the German model, UK model. We're going to keep a, a list here because it's not clear to everyone what they all mean. But um, we, we, you know, you'll see both in CORD's rare disease strategy from 2015, there are some definitions in there. And in the upcoming submission, we'll do our best to, um, to elaborate on, you know, the outcomes of this, these kinds of discussions. Okay, the next group leader, um, group three or group four? I think group three is us. Okay. Uh, so the first uh, point we would like to put forward is uh, evidence generation. So we should uh, probably reimburse easy, more easily, assess value and um, generate evidence and then reassess again to make sure we, we, we cope really with the decision. So this includes using international real world evidence data because there's never enough data just in Canada. The other point would be to implement genomic texting in clinic uh, coast to coast. And this will help to enrich our database uh, of patient uh, well characterized. I want to be short. That Excellent. Thank you, Nathalie. And who's next? Group four or five? I'm, there, there was a couple of rooms that weren't full so uh, or had to move around. So who's next? If we get up to 10, I was in group 10, then I'll know we've actually covered everybody. I can, but go, I won't next. Come to... I can go next if you want, Bill. I, I was in group six, but you know, I, so I'm a bit ahead of the, the game here. But uh, if you're okay, I'll go, go for ahead. it, Jerry. Yeah. All right, uh, so um, key point, uh, it was sort of discussed already, but I, I'm gonna make some distinctions here. So treating physicians should be driving clinical decision-making and should be involved in reimbursement, decision-making and evidence gathering. And when we say physicians, I, I said physicians, sorry, we, uh, we clarified that later. It's um, treating uh, members of the multidisciplinary team, including patients, Need to be part of that decision making. Um, it needs to be a national program, not federal, but national. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel, build from existing models. We've already talked about that, but a couple of uh, additional models that you can put into your sort of thinking is the Fabry's disease experience and the uh, passion d'exception model in Quebec as uh, potential ways forward. Um, and, and the point was made in that context, avoid the, um, the search for perfection. You know, let's just do something that's based on a uh, good experience. Um, and then the last comment is that the strategy should be co-developed by patients and stakeholders. Um, maybe think about the agile regulation model as a way to, to sort of characterize that. So, you know, an iterative process where patients and other stakeholders are involved. So those are the key points for our session. Excellent. Thanks, Jerry. Who's well, next? Group seven or eight? We're not at 10 yet. Hi, uh, Jerry. Uh, Bill, uh, it's Louise uh, from uh, Mitsubishi. I was in group four. I know that uh, Robin and Doug are here. Do you want to comment on uh, this and, and or Norm? Or maybe I can go very high level if uh, if it's if it helps. So there's a few things I think uh, that uh, were already said, but um, one of the points that were raised is that uh, many people like the European models, especially the German uh, model for early funding. And then uh, as we pursue the negotiation, as the industry pursues the negotiation, then there's uh, uh, like value-based models that can be uh, assessed. 
Another key point was uh, the uh, around the real world the evidence that was mentioned uh, earlier. Um, uh, a key point was possibly consider a national registry for rare diseases, where then it could be segmented uh, within the different uh, diseases with metrics that apply to these uh, diseases as we move forward. And if this were to be considered, the other element was that these uh, be held by a sole one um, overarching committee to make sure that uh, every time there's a new disease or if the, there's new metrics that we uh, put into it, that they be done in a timely uh, manner. And uh, the other element, I think, was uh, considering um, uh, innovation, uh, whether the new treatment will bring innovation uh, to treat symptoms, to treat a cure, or what type of innovative value does that new treatment bring to the, to the marketplace, especially when you have to consider that uh, if, you, if ever you're coming into a very or highly genericized marketplace. Thank you, Louise. That was great. So that was four. Um, how are we doing for the middle numbers? Anyone else? There's a bingo game later that we're going to be playing. Who's next? I don't Bill, know. I can go. Okay, oh, go for it. Sorry. Um, it's Joan and I was group 12, so I'm above 10. Um, I, I, by the time you hit group 12 and, and this stage, everybody's pretty much covered all the things that you were going to say. I think that we the couple of things that are different for us and just comments. Um, one, of, uh, one of the participants had mentioned that really the town halls we, they, we were a wasted opportunity. They were, there's so much, there were so, there's so many more issues than just the high cost of drugs um, in a rare disease strategy. And to focus just singularly on that was a wasted opportunity. Um, the other thing we did, we did talk to about, as well about looking at other countries and we, we focused, our two focuses were the UK and Germany. But again, uh, the one thing we noted was, I mean, we'd like to have a national or a federal strategy, but you know, as long as the provinces have control over healthcare, some of these other models are not gonna be able to to work very well or just be trans, transposed or transferred to a, a Canadian model. Um, if the things we were gonna focus on, we'd focus on patient values, not high cost. We'd focus on interim access during approval, uh, make sure that early access in, is imperative. And we would also, because government can't understand all of the diseases, we want experts on panels. Um, uh, and the thought was, do we need a separate agency outside of CAT? Those I think covered most of what we and 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 basically the it's the problem we have is a problem that hasn't it's been addressed before other places somebody's got a solution we just have to go out and find that what works for us. And uh, you've heard me say it before and I'll I'll quickly repeat it because somebody brought it up early the UK model the United Kingdom is a federation has got four countries within it and so it's a framework and every country can actually implement the strategy in its own way. And so there are some federated models that I, even Germany is a federation too. So maybe that's something that we need to look into is some, some experts in, in cooperative federalism to be able to achieve this kind of thing. Because I heard that from Jacob and everybody, hey, they figured it out. What's wrong with us, right? Um, okay, who else wants to go? Because if I'm uh, not I hearing- can go. From, Okay, that's great. Thank you, Danielle. No, it's Manon, Team 11. Oh, Manon, pardon. You're Danielle. <laughs> I, will be, you I, will, Zoom screen. No, I will be the next. I'm nine. <laughs> okay. <go>. okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Team 11. Uh, we identified that the two priorities we identified were equity of access and international clinical expertise and data. So for equity of access, and sorry if I'm uh, repeating what's already been said, I was uh, focusing on getting the email, so maybe I didn't hear what was said. So uh, we had addressing provincial inequities in drug access and patient out-of-pocket costs. Also, there's a need for central funding and separate drugs uh, for rare, pro separate, uh, separate program for drugs for rare disease for the whole country. Um, we uh, uh, determined that we need to develop metrics on drug approval time, drug access, patient diagnosis, and centers of excellence. 
And also uh, the patient needs to be involved in the entire process uh, of the drug life cycle. So research, drug development, drug approval, reimbursement. And for international clinical expertise and data, uh, we need to leverage international rare disease clinical and re real world evidence collection and data sharing, and also adopt best uh, the best practices from the rest of the world uh, on drug approvals, funding support, and negotiation, negotiating agreements. Well, that's a long list. Thank you, Manon. Um, <laughs> Danielle, do you want to go next? And then we'll, we'll do one more group, but I think we're running over time, so we might save the rest for, for email in the chat group. So, Danielle yeah. and then uh, Rachel. Yeah, uh, regarding, uh, you know, the public health centered, uh, we uh, indicated that having, you know, a, a funding centralized will be the best because uh, to have equity uh, across the provinces, because right now the small provinces like PEI uh, very often cannot afford uh, rare disease uh, therapy because they don't have the budget for that. So that could be uh, solve the problem and have equity across the provinces. Uh, the other one would be uh, to, like a uh, Trebrezheim example, to have a centralized uh, expertise to evaluate the patient and make sure, you know, the approach uh, for uh, a specific rare disease uh, should be um, uh, standardized or at least, you know, uh, consistent because um, we had a, a patient in our panel and uh, this patient indicated that, you know, the uh, diagnosis done by uh, a specialist in Canada uh, was very different than uh, in other uh, jurisdiction. And she had to go to US uh, to get the proper treatment because in Canada, they didn't have the expertise. So uh, that could help, you know, to have a, a standardized approach for the treatment. And again, uh, we looked for the uh, UK model where it's possible to have a rapid access with the, uh, a budget which is provided uh, by uh, UK for, to get access to the drug. And also the other point is we, you, we talk about patient, but the point which has been highlighted is patient-centered is fine, but the patient is a person. Okay. Thanks, Danielle. That's, that's really helpful. Okay, we're gonna go for two more. In 47 seconds or less, I see Liliana um, you know, can, can weigh in and Rachel, and I hope we got everyone, but if not, we're going to go back to email. So Liliana and then Rachel. Okay. Thank you. So uh, similar to the themes that everyone brought forward in terms of equity, uh, sustainability, time is of the essence. Those were the core components of each of the suggestions. I'll ask Lindy to pipe in as well quickly, but uh, one key thing that was brought up early into the conversation was the piece of early diagnosis and the impacts it could also have in actually uh, making efficiencies in, um, in, in, in drug costs and uh, obviously access, access to treatment as well. Um, the other piece too, in terms of condensing the process, uh, there's clearly, a lot, as mentioned earlier, in terms of bureaucracy, that's involved in that time is of the essence. So that needs to be shaved off to ultimately lead to patient access earlier rather than later. And then the other piece I just wanna quickly mention, and I'm sure Lindy could provide more details on the points I've brought up is uh, the clinician expertise. Given the small number of patients, um, it's, it's probably untenable sometimes to have a provincial a clinician expert. So perhaps looking at that expertise at a national level as opposed to a regional level. Thank you, Liliana. And so, and Lindy, thanks for putting your, your output into the chat box because we are we are running really over time. But um, uh, Rachel uh, or Lee, why don't you uh, help uh, help wrap this up and then we'll, we'll get on to the, uh, the final panel of the day. Sounds good. Happy to jump in. Thanks, Bill. Um, our, I'd say our top three concerns, and we heard I heard them from a lot of a lot of you guys here today, um, is you know maybe adding a fourth element to that north star about the ethical imperative. Bill mentioned earlier in the chat box the the you know the Samaritan provisions that exist in civil law, um, but you know these these treatments exist. Do we not have a, an ethical duty to help people with them um, to sort of round out those those pillars, those sort of guiding 
not guiding stars, those guiding elements of the star. Um, we also talked a lot about patient engagement. Do we need patient reported outcome measures to really be uh, uh, weave, woven into the various uh, kinds of data that is that are being collected? And when we have data that's being collected, can we not do that in a more systematic way so that we're collecting data across the country in a similar way we can, we can put that data together, have a bigger pool of information to, uh, to, to, ask, to ask questions about and uh, make sure that we're tracking what's happening with patients when they do and don't have access to these treatments. Thanks. Okay, okay well, listen, that was great. Thank you all for uh, the rapid fire brain dump, which is something that the, my notes for how to, how to get this out from everyone I thought was successful. If we didn't get to you, please, Send, either put it in the chat group or simply send an email to info at raredisorders.ca and uh, we'll be using this to compile. Um, and so with that, uh, I don't know, Angela, how you're going to manage the, um, you know, the videos and, and all of that, but uh, we've got an, an incredible panel to wrap up uh, today's session. Um, uh, we're joined by, uh, by people from, I, I, I think, across the country. We've got a um, Dr. Hamira Osman, Director of Knowledge Translation and External Engagement with Muscular Dystrophy Canada. So welcome, Hamira. Um, we've got Dr. Angela Genge, and uh, Angela has been out um, to uh, um, this group in, in the past. And, and thank you, Angela, uh, for joining us again. Um, Director of Clinical Research at the Montreal Neurological Institute and Director of the ALS Clinic. I just love where you work. It's called the Neuro. Um, it sounds very Star Trek. So welcome, Angela. Uh, we've got Nathalie Wimay, um, uh, who is one of the leaders of the, of the, of the group. And again, uh, Nathalie has, you know, she, she came and helped us celebrate Rare Disease Day. Um, I think that was, that's just last week. I think it was the week before last. Uh, Vice President of Projects and Programs at, at uh, Montreal in Vivo. And finally, we've got uh, Dr. Dr. Michael May, uh, President and Chief Executive Officer um, at the Center for Commercial Commercialization of Regenerative Medicines, or, or the CCRM. So um, before we get started, uh, I want to just make a note that the Durhan tagged in on the chat group uh, to say that there are so many problems beyond just medicines, and that's why we need an overall rare disease strategy, not just a drug strategy. And to include this throughout, that's something that really came through loud and clear. And in fact, it's 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 you know part of the kickoff for this for for this discussion. The fact that a rare drug strategy has to be integrated integrated into a rare disease framework, and the question of where should Canada invest a billion dollars over the first two years to support uh, this strategy. And so, just to quickly recap, in 2015. Uh, Canada, the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, and this was a culmination of, of you know, years of work and, in, and hundreds of pages and, and of, of people actually from governments, uh, health systems, clinicians, patients, uh, developers, etc. Um, and a lot of this was actually built on the, the UK concept of a federal model. And they said, look, we need to do five things, newborn and geno genomic screening and diagnosis, better and more Canadian networks and clinical research expertise, community and patient group support, multiple models of drug access, and uh, supports for research from the lab to manufacturing and getting it into the arms and mouths um, of patients. So with that, we've got an amazing panel to take us into, into this discussion. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. Uh, and just thinking back over the last five to 10 years, what has been the most impactful change here in Canada with respect to your rare disease area? And it can be at the local health system or clinical level. You can even share an anecdote from a, an individual patient experience if, that, if that's appropriate. Or at the provincial or national or even federal level or even thinking beyond Canada. So just what has been the most impactful change on the lives of patients and your ability to do your job here in Canada with, with RARE. So maybe we'll start with, um, with uh, Muscular Dystrophy Canada and uh, Dr. Osmond. Thanks, right, there you thanks are. So much. 
<laughs> Thanks. Um, so when I looked at this question, I should first start off by saying that Muscular Dystrophy Canada is an umbrella organization. We represent patients, family members, clinicians um, from a group of different muscle diseases. Um, today we heard from Susie around SMA, but we represent individuals with Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, um, a, a number of different uh, disorders. CMT can be examples as well. And one thing I would say is there have been a lot of developments within the past five to 10 years. SMA is a great case example and one that we often bring up when we're, we're meeting uh, together with CORD. We have seen in the past five to 10 years um, approved treatments. We have two approved treatments for SMA in Canada. We have one that is um, under approval right now or under review, I should say. Not only are these uh, treatments for infants and children, but also for adults as well. We're also seeing newborn screening. So newborn screening for SMA has been approved in Ontario this past summer or summer of 2020. This is the first neuromuscular disease to be approved on a newborn screening panel. And Muscular Dystrophy Canada is working on a partner project to help implement newborn screening for SMA across all provinces and territories. In addition to that, I would say we have been seeing better genetics or improvement in identifying um, the, uh, the genetic causes for different uh, neuromuscular conditions. I like to use the example of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. The gene for that was identified in 1991. By the year 2000, there were 18 genes identified. And by 2020, there were 120 different genes. With better diagnosis, with earlier diagnosis and better access to treatments, um, I think that that, that is, is ultimately a really exciting time um, in the past five to 10 years. We're also improving in terms of clinical care guidelines. While the uptake might not be an improvement, but it is something that I would say is um, is been a great focus, especially in terms of transition from pediatric as these children are living longer and transitioning from pediatrics to adult, um, that has been definitely a, a win or a success that I wanted to highlight. Thanks so much. Uh, Dr. Genj in Montreal. Hello, everyone. Um, that's a big question, Bill. Um, so in some ways, my world has changed a lot. In some ways, we're still fighting the same battle. Um, I'm going to focus on ALS as a good example of rare disease. Uh, we've had good come out of very tragic stories. And I think um, everyone on this panel knows about ALS and everyone on this group knows about Muriel Belanger and his very public fight with this disease. Um, that was really sad. Um, we worked very hard together, um, but out of his tragedy came um, an all party effort at the level of the federal government. It's called the ALS caucus. And this group is, de uh, is a group of MPs that are devoted to helping us get the ALS um, programs move forward and in fact, rare disease in general. And they've been incredibly engaged. Um, we're still working with them on some, some asks that would really catapult um, the efforts to find treatments for ALS uh, forward quickly. But I certainly I feel that that all party caucus has been a really important partner in this uh, with uh, between myself as a clinician and, and clinical trialist, ALS Canada, and and in fact, the provincial society. So I think that's one big example. Second big example, um, which in fact has a follow-on example is really grassroots. It was an ALS patient of mine who lived in Ottawa that actually lobbied successfully Brian Parsons for the extended leave uh, for caregivers. Um, for uh, who are um, our partners who are uh, taking care of patients with rare terminal disease. Um, and that particular paid benefit has already benefited hundreds of people, maybe thousands in Canada. And that's only three or four years ago that he did all that lobbying by himself while, well, not completely by himself, he had support, but he was the front person. And he, he was just an ordinary guy who developed a disease and, and went for it and was able to convince uh, the feds to change their policy. Um, I think that is the second example of change. Third example, um, 
and I know Louise is on, I've seen her name flow past, has been in some ways the approval of radicava as a second treatment for ALS. And the reason that has been so big has been not only the impact of having a second treatment for ALS to slow down the disease, but it has really given me and the community the opportunity to educate Health Canada on ALS so that as they're starting to see an abundance of clinical trials coming to Canada um, in ALS, that they are far more educated into what ALS is as an example of rare disease, the need for a rare disease like strategy at Health Canada, which we're definitely using because I've tested it with other rare diseases. And really it's what we've learned through the process of getting approval and reimbursement for Radicava that has really given us the framework of what we got to, I, should I say, what we need to do better, what needs to be improved in our system, including what I call my personal nightmare, which is PMPRB um, and its changes, uh, but others as well. And we really, um, we learned a lot through that process. We're learning more, but it has certainly taught a lot of people, including patients, about the post Health Canada approval problem to, with Thank access. You. Yeah. Well, that was that was um, a very comprehensive list based on your experience in in Ottawa and, and Montreal. And that's just a tip of the eye. That, that's something you do on a big corner of your desk. Other than that, you're treating patients and, and researching new medicines, right? So this is... Uh... Yeah, so the, my, my part-time job is the CRU, which we have 120 active trials right now. Um, and a couple of years ago, I launched a rare disease clinical trial network across the country for early phase clinical trials. The main objective is to get the system in Canada, the clinical trial network in Canada strong enough that we can attract all of the exciting new therapies for rare disease early so that Amazing. we get the phase one gene therapies for OPMD and all that stuff. So that's and my the, other part time. Yeah. The point in saying that though, is you're actually implementing Canada's rare disease strategy in what you do on a daily basis. So yeah. that's, you know, thank you for that. Nathalie, uh, still in Montreal. I'm not uh, directly involved with rare disease patient or rare disease treatment, uh, but what, what we should, uh, maybe I would like to highlight is that since 10 years, I think the big change in Canada has been to, to, to start having data science in healthcare. Uh, 10 years ago, healthcare data was not an option. And now more and more we see provinces in Quebec in particularly getting organized to know what kind of data they have and trying to put that together to access data on, on demand. So I think for rare disease, this is a very good opportunity we should build on since we have a quite universal healthcare system. So we potentially could access uh, data to all uh, rare disease patients that are diagnosed uh, at a point of time. The other point I would like to put forward, it's a bit related, this genomic uh, improvement in science. So with all the knowledge we, we, we have now on uh, different uh, uh, variant, uh, 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 genomic variant that can identify a, a, a disease. We now have treatment to repair the genome, the genome to, to, to help uh, healthcare patients. So this scientific uh, improvement, which is also a good force in, in, in Canada, is also something we should uh, build on to, to develop our strategy, I believe. Thanks so much. And, and Dr. May, I believe you're in Toronto today, is that right? Yeah, close by, close by Toronto, but uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Bill, and a pleasure to be here. Um, so I, I run the Center for Commercialization of Regenerative Medicine, which is a uh, mission is to accelerate the development of technologies and products and to launch new companies in and around cell and gene therapy. Um, and, I, you know, I would say, you know, what's changed the most uh, over the last 10 years is just the, 
the pace of technology development, uh, including you know development of the gene editing tools and other related tools, which are really having uh, an impact. And also from a commercialization perspective, the um, the kind of the prevalence of a rare disease strategy driving the launch of a company. Uh, I think that there's a, you know it's much more of an of an option than it than it was years ago. And and just a little bit of you know about the the CCRM model. I mean we work with key stakeholder groups, academic researchers, clinicians, industry, and investors to create the right kind of an ecosystem uh, for for commercialization. And then and then my team adds gap filling infrastructure and expertise to, you know, evaluate technologies, bundle them into companies and, you know, de-risk them. But we also work with industry partners to, to provide services that attract uh, investment in companies to Canada, but also build capabilities for helping those companies. And, and then the third thing we do is act as investors, uh, kind of early stage seed investors. And I just wanted to, to provide that context because um, CCRM is a public-private partnership, uh, and it's a nonprofit. So its mission is to create a sustainable engine for these technologies. And you know, I think the you know, in terms of the rare disease space that you know, I felt the most impact from is we helped we helped found a company called AvroBio uh, in 2016. And within a year and a half, that company you know went uh, started clinical trials, uh, went public in the lysosomal storage disorder area, now run a, a series of trials. And actually CCRM exited from that company when it went public. And we've used that money to now reinvest in new companies, in funds, which I think is part of this need in the ecosystem to create you know, um, sustainable nonprofit support for um, you know, diseases that you know, seem challenging from a commercial perspective, but really which require new ways of thinking. Thanks, that, that, that's great. In fact, I think you actually answered the, the second question, which is you know, how have you worked with others? It seems, uh, Michael, that you work with everyone possible um, to be able to attract more investment in gene research and clinical um, implementation here in Canada, so we don't have to send as many kids to the states for stem cell stem cell transplants and and whatnot. And hopefully, more of that can happen at Saint Justin in Montreal or uh, McGill um, or in uh, at Sick Kids in Toronto. Um, what did you, what did you you want to react to some of the things that you you you've heard uh, uh, so far, uh, um, Hamira, uh, in terms of collaboration and where you'd like to actually be looking forward five years from now. Um, we've heard a bunch, we, 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 we've got a lot of um, feedback from the last group in terms of all the, you know, the obstacles and facilitators and where we want to go. And, and you know, we now have some of the, the experts across the country on actually making change. Are, are you more optimistic now after hearing some of the things today or, or more pessimistic? I definitely say optimistic. I, I just want to use this opportunity to kind of reflect also on the brain dump where, where it was mentioned around clinical expertise for rare diseases. And when I was thinking of this question around collaboration and opportunities for collaboration, one thing that was highlighted in that last session was around leveraging rare disease uh, registries from around the world and collaborating from an international perspective. Um, or um, And then also, so uh, MDC is currently funding and partnering on a neuromuscular disease network for Canada. This is a pan-Canadian network of clinicians and patients and researchers and stakeholders. And, and the idea here is by collaborating, we are able to help support this rare disease strategy. So ha having such mechanisms, I think will be really helpful. I already mentioned that even partnering with um, industry in terms of having a pilot program to introduce newborn screening is innovative, it's different, it's not how we would want to typically run things, but it is a way to pivot, to shift, and to help move things along um, in a quick way. So uh, yeah, Bill, I would say overall optimistic. Okay, thanks. Any other examples of uh, collaboration that, that folks want to bring forward that have, you know, um, I mean, I don't know if Nathalie, if you can share any any early learnings from some of the uh, the tables at Montreal and Vivo around this, because I think it's a multi-sectoral approach, right? You're not just bringing one group together, it's, it's many. 
Yes, we try to have a good representation of all the different stakeholders related to a topics, uh, to a topic, no S, uh, like we have in, on, on the table, Angela. Angela is part of that group. Uh, so clinician, researcher, uh, patient group, and um, companies, large companies, and, and, and several startups. We also have some working groups, especially for startups to understand their their needs and our approach is really to think about how can we be closer to the uh, France model or the uh, German model. Uh, I think we can do that and we have all the uh, the will actually. I think the private and public will to do it is really something I, I've realized. People want to work together uh, and I think we, we should get that opportunity to really push forward and having a, a structuring proposal, you know, just uh, as we said, oh, everyone said around and not just a, a, a price uh, strategy for, for drug for rare disease. It's only a small piece. We are such a small market that if we don't have a whole environment that will be open to uh, uh, attract uh, private investment, attract uh, clinical trial, we will never be there. So we really need to have a whole ecosystem. And I, I really like your model to uh, the CCRM. It's really what I was having in mind. I didn't know do you exist. I think that if we want to take the 1 billion of the federal government, we need to think about something that could be sustainable with time. Uh, part of it could be to invest in company and, and get uh, uh, on the uh, action the, to get uh, you know royalties interest within the company so Bonjour. shares ah, yeah. shares baby yeah. so that you can reinvest in a not for profit and, and this money I, I don't think it's the, the way you do at CCRM but uh, I think that you know government federal government is talking about national pharmacare to to really have a national insurance to pay for drug because even if it's uh, cover 80% by your private insurer, uh, if it's a $100,000 a year, it, it's quite a lot of money for, for everyone, uh, every month for a small family. So maybe part of that punk of money, we could have a, a bucket to try to help to cover the other 20% that needs to be uh, covered to, to help really patient to, to have access to good drugs. So, I mean, there's, we should think about that, that chunk of money and, and try to, to go as far as possible with that and to really have something that will be, that will live on the long term. Yeah, Bill, could I respond to that? Yeah, we. Of course. Yeah, I, mean, yeah I, th I think, I think that's the right way to think about it. I mean, on the, on the, uh, at the early stages, you want to take that billion and leverage it immediately with other support partnerships, whether that's the private sector or, exactly. or whatever. The, the initial is a Foundation. leverage point. But, but then I think that, um, I think there are commercial models uh, um, that, and if we think bold enough and, and consider that, you know, billion dollars as not all of it, but some piece of it, as, um, as an investment in, in industrializing or commercializing, because you really need to do that to get products to patients. Um, but if you, if, if you consider that to be an investment that Canada makes uh, that can be realized in other countries, so it's not just the Canadian market, it's something we can export, then really what you might be able to do is to you know, have a return on that billion dollars that will sustain investment in this field for much longer. And in fact, I would think if you, if we come up with a, a novel plan to do that for the government, they will be quite impressed and more apt, I think, to accelerate and support where they see themselves as getting uh, a different kind of return um, uh, and also relieving them of long-term support by creating a sustainable model. And I, you know, it's, 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 it's creating Canadian advantage from investment from the government. So, and it's just one second, Bill. It's maybe an hybrid between the, uh, you know, the charity uh, sponsorship. Uh, 
I mean, you bring different stakeholders to, to, to for risk sharing, but you can also have uh, incentive to to so many different things to to really uh, ah, j'ai perdu mon idée. It will come back. <laughs> so basically, Michael, no, you're what saying. What I, I mean is that oh, we have several go. models in Canada that are very close to that already. So that we could, yeah. you know, demonstrate that it's feasible and, and we can make it. It's also like social impact bound. It's a mixture between social yeah. impact bound and commercialization of the CCRM and, and maybe a, a bit of national pharmacare in there. But I mean, it, it's not. It's not that big. I think we can make it. So maybe for a, a you know an interesting submission to the, the the strategy in Health Canada is to have an appendix of some of these examples in Canada that are already working. And uh, we were on a similar panel a couple of weeks ago, as you'll remember, with the whole genome sequencing system that that, that is being implemented across Canada in a in a way in a federal way that respects jurisdictions but get stuff done and they figured it out. So I thought that was kind of kind of cool. So do more by thinking differently. And then Angela, you said there was a, you had a nightmare, a recurring nightmare around the PMPRB. It, maybe there's like do less on some things too. So do, do you want to elaborate on, on your, your nightmare or is it too, too fresh? No, no, it's not too fresh. It's, it's ongoing. And all of you are fu fully aware of what the challenges are. Um, the, um, the problem that I've, you know, we all see is that we can make Health Canada as, as efficient as we want to make them. The real slog in access to therapies for our patients is the post Health Canada, uh, approval process. And, you know, when we're feeling quite, um, Canadian and proud of our healthcare system, we're completely forgetting that in a number of countries around us, as soon as a drug is approved by their equivalent of Health Canada, they can get access to the drug. They may have to apply to their insurance company. They may have to apply somewhere else. But I'm thinking specifically of the US, um, Germany, Italy, uh, to name three, Australia to name another, where once a drug is approved, patients can get access. And we have this, this pride in our healthcare system that's slightly misplaced. If you have a rare disease, a serious disease, a rapidly fatal disease, where but between the time Health Canada approves something and how our system gets it to uh, provincial formularies. And I live in Quebec, which has the fastest route of all of the provinces. Um, Patients are dead. They can't get it, take advantage of it. So, so I think there is a real, um, I don't know who I'm gonna offend with this one, but I think there's a real problem we have because of this sort of pride in having a national healthcare system um, prevents us from being as the general public at least from being honest about just what that currently means in Canada, because the National Farmer Care, which was started for whatever reason, not a bad idea, is totally penalizing all the patients I see. We have a patient uh, in Quebec. I don't know if Natalie is aware of him. He's an ALS patient. He has started a petition. He's got somewhere close to 30,000 signatures about creating a rapid access program, uh, program for patients with ALS for new drugs once they're approved by Health Canada. The, he knows that it's not the Health Canada approval process that's the problem. It's the minute something's approved, it languishes. Just so. one, one concept or idea there that we keep on pointing to a couple of countries in Europe, um, both France and Germany, actually in the UK too, they don't do HTA reviews for every drug. If a drug is not going to sell more than, you know, 20 or 30 million euros, they don't even bother. And then you can negotiate it in order to get access to it. So Canada's a bit of an outlier in that we want to review everything that could potentially, you know, get used in the health system for cost effectiveness and clinical effectiveness. And we, by the time we're finished doing that, you know, 
it's often, as you said, too late, and, that, and that's a tragedy. Well, We're the, running up. Bit... There's one Sorry, other, go just one last point because you brought it up. Uh, um, I consider it an insult to Health Canada. I don't think they consider it an insult. I consider it an insult that they spent three to six months in a priority review doing a very deep dive into the results of a, 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 the package that's being submitted. And PMPRB with far less background, far less scientific uh, validity, repeats the whole thing and says it's not useful. Like I have a huge problem with, with the fact that you're allowing a para-government agency basically undermine what Health Canada has just spent six months reviewing. And I've sat on all the committees, the INES, the CADF, the PMPRB, the, I've sat on all the committees and I just, I think there's a problem. And, and thanks, Angela, that was, that was very helpful. Um, now, maybe we'll leave it uh, with one final statement from each of you and then we're gonna turn it back to Durhan to, to explain what we're doing tomorrow. Um, why don't we go back to Humira? Um, and what are your final thoughts for this group, uh, knowing that we're at the halfway point through Rare Disease Conference? Tomorrow is going to be a big day too. What are, you, what are your final thoughts on, on what we can do with that billion dollars and really smartly? So first of all, I just want to echo what Dr. Genj had, had shared um, in terms of uh, her thoughts around PMPRB and the HTA. As a representative of a patient advocacy organization, I think I would want to use this time to highlight that when we're thinking about this federal model uh, around uh, this national strategy for high cost drugs for rare diseases, the involvement of patients and family members need to be embedded at every single level. Um, and even considering HTA was mentioned today, thinking about the impact rare diseases or treatments have on family members and caregivers, and that needs to be included as well. So I would say that that is a, a key uh, component. I, I talked about leveraging global registries, the point of also even talking about whether we need HGA for some of these ultra rare disorders has been mentioned as well. Um, I also want to, to take this time to mention that I think we need to have further or more meaningful involvement of patients and families. So for example, as part of my work, I submit uh, to Kadath and to INES. And sometimes I wonder how meaningful or helpful or impactful that is in decision making. And so I think um, my note would be as we're developing that national strategy to think about how meaningful it is. And then how helpful is it that I submit to Kadath and INES? And then I also submit to BC on its own and provincial, same process gets repeated again. So thinking about streamlining and efficiency there in terms of patient input. Thanks, that, that's a great suggestion. Uh, Michael, last final words before the end of uh, this afternoon. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, you know, our, our mission is to generate health and economic benefits. And so thinking about, you know, I'm always thinking in commercialization about, about the, um, the economics. And I, and I think sometimes that that's a difficult conversation to have because everyone focuses on cost and, you know, is it worth it and, 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 and so I think that we need to change the paradigm for the government that this is an investment um, and that Canada can benefit uh, both economically and its, its patients. And the, and the second point is, is it this really, if we get the ecosystem right, and that's why I really you know, love engaging this group, if we get the network right, if we get the ecosystem right, everything will take care of itself. It really does require that high degree of, of collaboration. And the third is, and this is part of the pitch to the, you know, to the government, is, is if we can tackle all the challenges of rare disorders, whether it's the, pay, you know, the urgency of regulatory approval and the health economics and the challenges of manufacturing and the small market sizes, it opens up the door for uh, applying these, you know, future medicines to broader applications. If we get it right and focus on that as an investment, you know, we can be global leaders in, uh, in a broader area of industry. And that's the story of Boston, right? And Genzyme grew out of that. And now there are dozens and dozens of, of companies that, are, are, that make that Kendall Square in Cambridge the, 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 the center of, of research globally. Um, Moderna is, is there, right? Yeah. but we, but rare disorders are not the exception. We should be using them as a driver. 
Like yeah. I, I, we, you know, we need to flip the paradigm around a little bit, I think. Excellent, thank you. Nathalie, any final words? I think our main challenge will be to collaborate and her, arriving with the more or less single voice to influence as much as possible the federal government, uh, keeping in Quebec, I always have to be careful to, to, to think about uh, provincial competency versus federal competency. So it, it's not an easy, uh, easy straight line, but I think it's feasible. We have to identify where the federal government could support uh, and, and try to, to work together will not be an obvious uh, challenge, but I think we can make it. Uh, there's a good example of success uh, if we think about, uh, I really like the way you present, Michael, uh, the investment, because if we can provide the right medication to the patient, they will not be any more disabled, they will be able to work, so that, that, that there's a, a very nice uh, uh, is storytelling to, to, to put in place. So I think we have a good opportunity. So probably CORD is a good way to, to, to connect all together. Um, I look forward in, in our next uh, discussion. Yeah, look at this. We've got a matchmaking going Toronto, Montreal. What's gonna happen next between uh, Michael and Nathalie? Uh, we're gonna start rumors. Angela, um, I saw Durhan come on. So we got, you, you, wrap, uh, you can take us home with your, your last, uh, last comments, if you, if you will. I'd love us to use technology and AI to really connect and make it a powerful voice that we have. <laughs> That's my, that is my new passion. I'm hopeless at it. I couldn't do it as a profession for the life of me, but I see the value. Um, and it doesn't, it isn't just for research, it's for patients, it's for patient recruitment, it's for uh, trials, it's for advocacy groups. I think that's the power of AI, uh, not just making video games, but actually doing something for, for patients. It's, it's what's changing the lives of our patients who are at home now, and now we need to use it on en masse across the country. Amazing, thanks. And I, I'd love to turn from what you described as um, sometimes a field of nightmares into what Michael is describing into a field of dreams. We're gonna get James Earl Jones to tell people, you know, if you build it, they will come. And Durhan, over to you to explain how we're gonna build it tomorrow. What an amazing panel. I cannot thank you enough, Bill, for leading everybody through such a, a fulsome discussion. And uh, I'm glad you were able to get out of the nightmares into the dreams because that would not be the place <laughs> we wanted to have everybody dumped. So this was brilliant. And uh, I am um, reminded over and over again why Michael is one of my heroes. This is amazing. And uh, certainly the kind of work that does take place in Canada, we need to be able to highlight it and be able to showcase it more, but really be able to build on it. So, you know, the rare disease space hopefully is a great space for, for a lot of that to be coming, happening. And Hamira as well, you know, we've seen kind of how muscular dystrophy Canada has really taken on so many challenges and being able to provide leadership, everything from the patient support, the research, all the way through to what's happening in terms of the clinical and the development. Um, brilliant work in terms of, I mean, obviously you're more than a patient organization, but we know very proudly that patients are cornerstone in, in the organization. So I think it's just amazing in terms of what we've been able to go through today. Um, I'm sure that you're all glad it was no more than three hours. I think that if we'd done more, we could have been at such an amazing place. But uh, I'm finding that we're all being great in, in being able to use the space we've got. Tomorrow, as Bill says, we've got another amazing set of uh, opportunities in terms of panels. And hopefully, we'll be able to take us you know, back in terms of where some of the challenges are in terms of some of the therapies. What is it that, um, I think we heard some of the discussions today about different international models. We're gonna have a panel that will actually talk more deliberately about the international models for access to rare disease drugs, what we can learn from them. And uh, sadly to know that um, obviously that we cannot clone them nor are there any perfect models out there. So it's up to us still to be able to do that. We'll have another series of breakout sessions in which we're going to be 
actually able to take another dive in really harnessing people's uh, expertise in terms of uh, looking at, you know, how do we go beyond, as we say, the, uh, the drug access, but also what else needs to happen in terms of the rare disease ecosystem. So some of the things that you folks are saying today, I'm hopeful that people will be able to pick up and bring back into the discussion. And then we're gonna end with something which I think is critically important. And that is what I just labeled as hot topics, meaning there are many key issues that we are not able, we have not yet addressed. The issues that um, certainly, you know, in the consultation so far have not actually been able to, to uh, fully explore, but we're gonna have to. What we are desperate to do at the end here, and not just the end of this conference, not at the end of March when the consultations are done, but when we get to um, the implementation of a rare disease drug strategy, that we've got an action plan. And that action plan is actually able to move forward. We cannot afford to have just consultations and really great ideas and not put them into action. Somebody asked me, you know, what's different between this and all the other kind of, you know, frameworks, uh, proposals, strategies that have come out, which really have not necessarily, you know, turned into um, actual uh, plans, except for, you know, what's been going on the ground. What's the difference? And I said, we have a billion dollars on the table. Honestly, the billion dollars was offered. The billion dollars still sits there. It was recommitted last 2020. If we can't do what we need to do for a billion dollars, then you know I'm not sure who's going to be able to do it. So we have that opportunity. And the opportunity goes beyond just what does a drug strategy look like. It really has to address all of the issues that we're talking about here. Not that we're going to be able to pay for them with a billion dollars, but if Michael and Natalie are correct, we'll be able to leverage that to actually see much greater returns and to see Canada as really being one of those leading environments. Um, I go back to saying, even on the drug strategy point, there's nobody that's got it right, but we could get it right. And we have an opportunity to get that right if we do what this panel has actually also been able to do, and that is put the vision out there and let's see how we can work together towards it. So I thank you folks tremendously for having given us a rousing um, set of ideas at the for this panel and to, to take us into tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. Huge thanks to all the panelists, all the speakers, everybody in their breakouts who worked so hard. And of course, my huge thanks to Angela Cavada, who has been a real champion in moving us in and out of groups and not losing people along the way. Uh, Hillary for keeping us in, in uh, communicating and also putting all, all the information through the uh, social media to raise awareness around this. And obviously, you know, huge thanks to, uh, to Bill for, for um, marshalling us through some of these great discussions. And I would be remiss not to say, I'm not gonna read them all out right now. Huge thanks to all of our corporate uh, sponsors. Um, you know, we, we remain committed to uh, being able to work through in partnership. Your contributions and your, you know, unrestricted support of what we're doing really makes a huge difference in our being able to continue on this work. So we look forward to even more of those collaborations. So we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you ever so much.